um, the brown. I don't know who the friars are. There's like it feels like the Franciscans are always splitting off and becoming more and more yeah, yeah, yeah. cool and radical. I'm thinking I don't know which group it is, but I know that they don't own cars. They hitchhike. Uh huh. <laughs> they. Uh, I think they wear the tonsure. Because you were asking me my favorite habit, yeah. that would be it. I think. Yes, I, I don't know. I don't know. I've never met any tonsured Franciscans at this point. Yeah. Well, you could start it. What would happen if you started it? What would people in your community think? Say, <laughs> if, you just, if you just started, you know, you could grow it out gradually. You know what I mean? Just yeah. gently shave yeah. that. Yeah. You know, um, generally we're pretty open to people doing slightly weird things. It'll like take. That. It'll take a minute. And then probably it would start with like some sort of like, like some jokes, some like sort of like gentle, like, what are you, what are you, what's going on with that? Yeah. But if it went full tonsure, probably at some point it'd be like, come on. Yeah. Don't be stupid. Um, that is, that is one of the things I do love about the Franciscans. It just feels like that. Why have we got this here? This is, this, <laughs> this is kangaroo testicles. That's what it did looked you know like. That? You might want to show that to uh, Hunter. Give, give him a look at this. I don't know why we're doing this, Father. You asked me if I, I don't have a job, and if I did have a job, I'd be fired by now. <laughs> These are kangaroo testicles that I bought from Australia. It's also a bottle opener. Would you like to touch it? No. Um, I don't know why I had it there. That's why I was... No, because I left. It wasn't there, and then it was there, and it felt very uncomfortable. Like on purpose. Oh, and, and very, I see. Yeah, like very... maybe he's Australian. He likes to... <laughs> no, but yeah, I, I do love that about the Friars. There's something... And even just what you said there about how like there's a there's an openness to people being a little weird and yeah I talked about this uh, last time on the show but just this messiness to the friars that you're comfortable with that yeah yeah and that's it's I don't know I don't I haven't like totally analyzed it but I can definitely say it's a thing yeah. I don't know totally why it's a thing but it is now, a Franciscan thing when you join the cap when the friars of the renewal CFR stands for Capuchin friars of the renewal right or uh, technically the community of Franciscans of the renewal oh okay. Because we're not like being a captain means something very like technically, and, yeah. and we're technically not captains, right? But we understand ourselves to be in the captain tradition. So we'll talk about that in a sec. But when you joined the CFRs, like, were you ever like, man, it would have been cool if it was brown or? I like the gray. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. No, no, I like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to have it for sure. I like to have it. Some of I don't know if this would. So this is like we have a couple of different varieties of the rope. Yeah, of the I cord. love that rope. And this is like the. There's like, this is the big one. There's like a little one. Please. So as long as I have this this one, this is like the boat rope. The boat rope. I'm, now, not, I'm not all about the little thin one. Now, the little thin one still looks coarse, or is it the white yeah. kind of altar boy no, one? No, 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 no. It still looks like this, and probably to the untrained eye, you couldn't tell a difference. That's but. what I love about your habits is they, they're they like made to live in. I love the TORs at campus, but it kind of looks like a dress. I, I feel you. Yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. And that's yeah. fine if you want to wear something. Like that. I love it. It's nice. It has the cowl. Is that yeah. what you call it? But um, anyway, I do like I like the color. Yeah, I like the darker. I do like the, I like the T O R habit. I like yeah. the cowl. That's a nice. It looks cool. I don't know if I'd want to wear it. For us, like a little bit simpler is better. Just everything one piece. Yeah. Um, I've met you once, but we barely chatted. So this is actually the first time we're getting to sit down and yeah. chat, which I'm super excited about. Um, you went to Franciscan. I did. I just my last year of school was here, so yeah. I came. Uh, I went to four colleges. So it was a bit of an interesting college career, but the okay. as I was in college is when I started pursuing the friars, and they recommended I come out here to finish up my philosophy to have it was called the pre thee program at the time. Now it's the mm -hmm. PDP. So they like kind of have a little year formation on my way out to New York. Ultimately, when did you discern priesthood? Like how old were you when you felt called to it? Yeah, it was freshman year of college. So was, I, I I am a cradle Catholic, and um, from Southern California, from Orange County. Nice. And uh, basically, freshman year of college, I a lot happened very quickly. Um, it was like the, it was also it was the first time I, st I wasn't going to mass. I went to a Jesuit university out in LA, and I was literally like fifty. Jesuit university in LA. That doesn't sound like a good combination. Well, yeah. I mean, nonetheless, that's <laughs> mm -hmm. where I received my vocation and everything. Awesome. And I was literally like probably fifty feet from the chapel. That's great. Um, but I didn't make that 50 feet journey on Sundays. And then I was at like a, a random college dorm party, had a conversation with a girl who said she was an atheist. I was like, how can you not believe? I realized I like, I did believe in it needed to affect the rest of my life. Heard about Mother Teresa. Oh, slow down. I'm loving this. I okay. want to hear more okay. about okay. this. All right. So you, you weren't an atheist. You'd stopped going to mass. Out of, um, out of apathy, not out of like a distinct yeah. turning away. Decision. Yeah. yeah. So basically, so I, I grew up... I grew up somewhat from like an affluent background. Okay. 
um, I don't just te- not somewhat. I grew up in an affluent background. Cool point. Yeah. And but one of the dynamics of that right is there's a um, there's a there's a component of like trying to have sort of like a certain f- um, what would be the word a certain image I guess basically like like people in sort of more affluent backgrounds like are kind of like like you just don't don't be weird like yeah. don't be crazy kind of like you know like there's certain sort of etiquette and whatever and so part of how that seeped into my life was um the idea of like i can f- you can go to mass on sunday right and you can probably go to youth group particularly if it's a friendly thing and you can do like mission work you can help the poor now and then but like don't get crazy don't get weird mm-hmm. and um and so I had this like really deep desire to be dynamic and well-rounded, which I thought meant, yeah, you can do some of these little things, but at the same time, you had to kind of be like everybody else with partying, with j- career choice, with things like that. Mm. And um, and that, so basically I had sort of compartmentalized my faith. And that is what, at this dorm party, freshman year of college, God broke through mm. and said, like, if you believe, you actually have to believe. You can't just like put it in a box. And so, um, and that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you were chatting with an atheist and that just sort of, you kind of became indignant that somebody could maybe it yourself. It's like, well, she says, you don't believe it. That's one thing I say I do. And I'm lukewarm about it or it, it was, it was really a God thing more than like a, just a practical thing. I was like, I was drinking, <laughs> this was like, I was 18. I was drinking like boxed wine out of a <laughs> no, diet see. Pepsi bottle. Oh dear Lord. That I mean, that's what because <laughs> it was like cheap. I mean, it was like Franzi. and as a fryer, that's all you guys can afford now exactly, too. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But it was like I don't know if you know like Franzi or something like that. It's like one of these, you no. know, it's like probably five bucks for it's five by a liter. You know, Patrick Madrid. You know who that is? Yeah, he really likes boxed wine. Uh huh. I'm like, how? Surely you can afford more than this. But anyway. But uh, yeah, and so it was really, it was really profound, like anointing, anointed moment. I wouldn't say it was totally like a, you know, a Saul on the way to Damascus gets knocked off the horse, but it was probably in that vein in so far as I just was, I mean, like it was, I was cut to the core that I believe in it needs to affect my whole life. And I, and I went, I was like, spent the whole night like praying and crying. And I called this lady from my church at like three in the morning and told her what happened. And she answered the call was she, she answered, was she in california yeah yeah yeah. so you were kind of in touch with catholic kind of people but totally it, my in in high school my like social my world my my social group was the church and so i was really involved okay with my youth ministry but it was more like it and that's the thing is it it was sincere it was just compartmentalized mm-hmm. and um and that was the moment where things broke wide open and then f- I had a great family and I had a, I had a good background. And so the soil was good. And so as soon as I gave God permission to like, f- I basically gave him a blank check that night nice. and things from there moved very quickly. That's awesome. Uh-huh. So then what, ha- what, what happened? You started feeling a call to the priesthood and how did you go from that to looking into the friars? So from, so that happened, say it was like November freshman year of college. It was my first semester. And um, then probably in the spring, spring I might not even been spring I think it might have been a few weeks later I was helping out with like a confirmation retreat mm-hmm. which in in our diocese you do like freshman sophomore year high school so mm-hmm. like 14 to 16 and I heard this guy speaking just in passing like literally it wasn't the point of his talk but he just mentioned Mother Teresa and it was a similar thing and I just experienced with deep down like conviction that I was made to give my life to the poorest of the poor and nothing else would satisfy man and it was it was just boom. It was like 100%. This is it. And there was no doubt about it. And so then I wanted, I wanted to give my life to the poor. And then slowly I started to learn more and more about the sacraments, particularly the Eucharist and confession, the mm-hmm. apostolic life. So I wanted to be a priest. And so I was looking for a place to work with the poor and to be a priest. And it was, do you know, in and out burger? Yeah. Love it. It was that in and out burger after some young adult meeting, I don't even remember the guy's name. He mentioned there's this group of Franciscans out in New York who are hardcore and sleep on the ground. And to my 19 year old self, I said, Dude, this uh, is it. That was me too. Yeah. And we just figured this out before in the car. You're one year younger than me. You yeah. 84? 80? 85. I'm 83. Yeah. Uh huh. That's cool. Did you go to any World Youth Days by chance? I've been to a couple. I went to Rome. That changed my life. I haven't. I, I, my first one was after Rome. Yeah, like it was Cologne, Sydney, where else? Pa- uh, Toronto. It was in Toronto, 2002, mm-hmm, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What What happened? 
Oh, I uh, went as a, an agnostic um, and just thought that God was something people believed in because they were afraid of death and stuff. And for the first time in my life, I encountered young people who really yeah. loved Jesus. And it shocked me. Like, it actually shocked me. Not just that they loved Jesus, but they were normal, cool, well-rounded, mm-hmm. free in a way that me and my friends weren't free. They weren't yeah. sarcastic. They were just joyful. And that just was unnerving. And I had, a lot, and I remember I was like dropping F-bombs like every few sentences. And for the most part, like people just seemed to kind of, and I think I was trying to shock them, push them away, test the ground. And they were yeah. just, just loving. And I just was stunned by it. I really remember just thinking, these people are really good people. How'd you end up on that? Just you wanted to go to Rome? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. My mum came home from mass one day and said there was. A, I, I stopped going whenever I could. And mum said there was this lady speaking about uh, Rome, uh, in Italy. They got a bloody thing called World Youth Day. You want to go? And I don't think at first she said Italy. She just said Rome, and I was afraid it was like an obscure town in mm-hmm. South Australia, mm-hmm. population thirty-two. <laughs> I was like, yeah, like Rome and Italy. She went, yes. Uh-huh. First thing she said was, I'm not paying all this money for you to go make a bloody idiot of yourself. And I said, well, thank you, but I don't plan on it. But you know what's funny is like even the Lord was like working in my heart then. I actually remember I didn't, I didn't believe in God, you know. I don't think I believed in God. Atheism hadn't yet become a shorthand way of saying I'm more intelligent than you. So mm-hmm. I, I was open to it. I just didn't get it, didn't care. And I remember just like almost being in tears that night. This sounds really poetic and maybe funny, but just the idea of experiencing another country and if, if, seeing rain fall on a different land and just, you know, just like really just that moved me and mm-hmm. I was excited about mm-hmm. it anyway. So that's Was that your first time out of Australia? Yeah. Yeah, that's the other thing. Like, you know, Australia is pretty far down there. Yeah. So you've got New Zealand, you've got, you know, Indonesia and things like that, Bali. Yeah. But we don't tend to travel or maybe we do now, I don't know, but people don't tend to go on vacations in the way Americans mm-hmm. do, like mm-hmm. Puerto Rico or Mexico, or even yeah. Europe. Like Europe's like five hours from here, right? Mm-hmm. Like Ireland. Yeah. Whereas in Australia, it's like 30 with stopovers. <laughs> yeah. So no one I'd ever known had been to Europe. So That's good. My first World Youth Day was the Australia one. Yeah, cool. But I do, it's far away. Yeah. It How long did it take there? You? That's a great, I, so well, I, I guess I could tell you since I've been there me. a thousand times from here. Did you fly out of New York? I was in, so it was, it was before I was a friar and this is part of God's providence. It was with I, my group from my parish ended up connecting with friars. And so we traveled with six of the CFRs. From California? From California. So we were like 12 hours to Sydney and then you, or Brisbane, and then usually from there you fly elsewhere. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, I think we were in we were in Sydney and Perth in McMaster's Bay. Oh yeah. Do you know McMaster's? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. cool. we have, we have um, one of our brothers, one of my classmates from seminary is from the Sydney area. Nice. Father Francesco. Okay. So you, you and a few group of friends went with Friars of the Renewal to World yeah. Youth Day. Okay, yeah. wow. And at this point, you're very open to joining them? Yeah, yeah. So basically, after in and out I went home, I read our constitutions, <laughs> wow. and I said, if this is real, this is every. This is like my heart on a piece of paper. This is everything I'm looking for. And so this is part of... I didn't have a spiritual director. Spiritual, spiritual director. I didn't really know. I didn't have a lot of formation. So the fact that like somehow I actually... My discernment worked out is very mysterious yeah. and not it wasn't the right way but when i was basically i took a gap year of college and i went and worked in a high school in rural south africa wow and while i was there my young adult group got connected with the friars in honduras started doing mission work with honduras wow. became friends and then that relationship continued which is how we ended up traveling to world youth day together okay what when you say the constitutions yeah tell people what that is and what's some examples of things that you read that struck you yeah that would, that's a great question so the constitutions are basically like um basically mission, mission statement i yeah. mean it's more than that it's like our way of life it's our rule it's our it, it's our values it's um it's what we feel called to do so it's it's not just like you know um whatever we will not eat cookies on non-feast days but it's also like the the spirit of following christ crucified and, and all that right yeah. and um it talks about our work with the poor. It talks about our work of evangelization. It talks about our pro-life work. It's just um, how we live and what we do and why we do it kind of written out. And for me, still to this day, going back to it, reading it, 
it speaks to me really mm. deeply. Correct me if I'm wrong. I remember looking into something when I was discerning the CFRs and there was one thing I read that said like, if the friars live in a kind of impoverished area that becomes economically prosperous, you have to move. Correct. Is yeah. that a part of the constitution? That's 100% part of it. Yeah. Tell us about that. Cause I remember reading that and thinking, wow, that's incredible. Yeah. You know, and that's, and, and that's the, like we, we value very highly living in areas of great need particularly material need, right? And so that that is that is something that we value. And part of it is just because we we don't want to just like like drop in and do a nice thing, but yeah. like to actually share our lives with our neighbors. That's so nice, yeah. And and be, you know, where they can come and knock on the door, right? And that so that's something that we really do value very highly. And so the idea is that just understanding that neighborhoods can change. Yeah. And so what if foresight, they, you know? To, yeah, to and then think that through. I wonder I, that's a great that's a great observation cuz I because our eight founders were all Capuchins. And I don't know that that's not like necessarily like a, a I don't know anyone else who does that. Yeah. So the fact that they were able to see that, the foresight, yeah, like you said, like it, I don't know where so, that came from. So when these founders founded the community of yeah. the friars or the Franciscans of Renewal? So Sorry, Franci CFRs, I'm trying to get yeah, that. Yeah, Franciscan friars. When, are the when they did that, did they just say, okay, we're going to go back to the actual constitutions of the Capuchins that we think are being lived loosey-goosey? Or did they kind of rewrite them? I think there was a lot of rewriting. Mm. So it wasn't just, and that's, to be honest, I, I am, I'm our founding and the wisdom behind it and some of the dynamics of it, I think was like really providential because it wasn't just, okay, we're going to go back. It wasn't this like antiquarianism, like everything that's older is better. It, it wasn't that, but it was like, we want to get back to the, the original like inspiration and we want yeah. to, um, well, this is during the time of John Paul II, the new evangelization. Yeah. Yeah. And y'all clearly, like, as you say, it's not about going back just to the past for the sake of yeah. it. I can't think of that many other religious orders that are so kind of kind of revolutionary in how they evangelize. Yeah. I, my kids love watching some of the videos on YouTube. You know, you guys playing basketball and yeah. you've, you've got these great companies that seem to really specialize in film and production. And Yeah, and that's, and that's part of, again, the providence of it. Because there was eight of them and they're very unique and very strong-willed. And, you know, we hear kind of the legends of like these eight these, chiefs. Huh? Yeah, 100 yeah. percent. These fights and these wars and these God. battles about every little detail. There needs to be a week. book written on that. 100 <laughs> percent. Even if it's just in-house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For you friars, yeah. Exactly. But part of that is like it wasn't just one person's idea of things. It wasn't just one person's like, like gift. It wasn't like a cult of personality, even mm -hmm. though there were like a particular Father Benedict Rochelle would have been really the, the leader of it. But because of these guys just kind of fighting together and working it out and having to create space for everyone. Um, but then like in from the very beginning, it was like Father Stan Fortuna. Yeah. Right. And Father Stan from our from again, from the very beginning, was doing music, was traveling, was doing all that. And so part of like Father Benedict, Father Andrew, Apostoli, Ron yeah. EWTN. So the media work and all that got in at the ground floor. And it's always been a part of our way of evangelizing. Did I tell you that I went to the Middle East with Father Stan Fortuna? You did not tell me that. Did I not mention that in the last uh, interview? I don't know. Uh, uh Where'd you Where'd you go? Uh, Abu Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Why not? I, it was so cool. <laughs> I, I just started working at Catholic Answers back in 2012, and mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. So I was like, "Hey, someone wants you to go to Abu Dhabi." I'm like, "What?" So we went and spoke at a big Christian conference there. Yeah. Together, that was the first time I met Father Stan, and I remember joking with my wife. Because, uh, you know, they said a few things to us. They're like, please do not mention the prophet because there will be like government people here. And yeah. I'm like, well, he's not a prophet, but okay. No. Um, but, you know, so I was, you know, you'd, you'd hear the call for prayer going off yeah. in the mosque next yeah. door as we were kind of preaching the word. And I remember joking with my wife. I'm like, I'm not getting martyred to just to go in the Magnificat as and companion right. next to Father Stan. <laughs> I'm not going down for that. No. Yeah. But yeah, we had a really good time. I mean, what a weird way to meet someone. We were like cam like riding on camels and they took us to some weird belly dancing thing. It wasn't uh, it wasn't shady or anything, but we were smoking hookah. Yeah. <laughs> like it was great to meet him. Yeah. When you were neat. doing like stuff at, for like the Steubenville conferences, things like that, were you with Father Stan a number of times? No, never. No, never. I maybe he kind of ended right before I okay. began. I'd begun like 2011. Yeah speaking yeah. at those big conferences yeah but it was really cool to meet i remember we had breakfast together one morning and he was kind of telling me how they how they were founded and he said that you probably heard the story or maybe maybe not but father grushel called him up and he just spoke very kind of uh, cryptically like the axe is being laid to the root <laughs> yeah what is what does that mean <laughs> yeah i guess as they were yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i mean i think um 
I mean, those are those are pretty legendary group of guys right there. Yeah. A couple of them. But but Father Stan's work is pretty unbelievable and the reach he had and uh the number of vocations and, and just really? yeah, just um and again, it's sort of um, trailblazing for us, the media work, the music, all that. Like he, he is uh, what he has kind of passed down to the younger friars and, mm. and sort of in, um, his own patrimony is given. You, how do you not, because um, I mean, by the way, it's interesting that earlier on you said like earlier on in life, you're expected to fit the mold. Yeah. And but, but also there's something with the friars, right? Where you said like there's some free reign to be a little weird, which I think is interesting, yeah. right? Um, how How do people kind of, uh, avoid going into the friars in order to have some sort of platform because mm-hmm. i imagine in other religious orders it's not like yeah you can be a traveling musician or you can be a youtube personality yeah. or you can start your own record yeah. or you can create your own records yeah um it, has that ever been it, to your mind like sh- a difficult thing to kind of rein in with people because it seems like you guys aren't under necessarily like the thumb of your superior or yeah. whoever in a way that others might be yeah yeah we don't play that we, we, like that we're mean? like we um i was i I do our the Friar podcast. When I do it with our vocations director and also our postulant director. And if you if you come saying like, yeah, I want to like I want to make sure I can use my gifts, things like that. That's not what we're about. Well, the other thing is, don't you have an eight or nine year formation period? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, totally. If you come with that, <laughs> you'll either be crushed and yeah. leave, or you yeah. will grow in humility. Yeah, and because for a number of years, especially the probably the first few years, whatever your gift is. You're not. We're not going to be like having guys who are in first year vows who are traveling the world doing music. Even yeah. if you might be a world class professional musician, right. you're going to have to. Because we we we're more concerned about you receiving the formation, and and what that entails than for you to get like your gifts going right away. Like that. If that happens, that'll happen with time. But, That's good, but we yeah. want you to learn how to pray, to serve the poor, to love the brothers, mm. and then like once we get like your sort of identity rooted then we can start yeah seeing what happens with what the was gifts. the most powerful part of your formation the uh living with brothers living with brothers for sure um to be honest, but i my vocation somewhat was easy at the beginning i think it's just a, it's i'm just a cfr i really am and like i, yeah. I like i read our way of life and i said this is my heart and piece of paper and i joined the friars and like this i just love everything that about it because i imagine some people are like i gotta sleep on the floor which sounds cool at first but five nights in may not yeah you were like just it was quite easy in that sense for you. yeah, yeah like, like i i i say this kind of jokingly but also kind of serious like the first time i had to like sing in public <laughs> that was probably like the hardest day of initial formation i never sang my whole life yeah but part of it was this idea of, of um, having to be like vulnerable and weak and imperfect in front of people who like who's yeah, that's, um, hard. that's why I don't like dancing. I don't, like, I don't like <laughs> seeming stupid. I don't yeah. like being. Yeah. 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 If you became a friar, you wouldn't have to dance. Is that right? Why not? Well, I mean, it's not really, it's not really like a thing that we're it's like. It's not like because I hear in your constitutions, a friar may not smoke tobacco. Is that correct? That's have, true. Yeah. But it doesn't say anything about dancing. No, no, right? no. Some guys good. are dancers. <laughs> Some guys are dancers. Some guys yeah. are not. Yeah. And no. But you know, you do a youth retreat. You got to do some like uh, hand motions every now and then. Or yeah, something. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't remember what we we're talking about right well, before. Well, that. The, the the most powerful part of your formation, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. is is there a period of formation where it's like we're just going to take a year, and there's going to be way more silence than you're comfortable with? Was there any of that? It's like that now. Mm-hmm. Our when I was a novice, that'd be like the novitiate year. Ours was, um, we were still, I think, working out our formation. Yeah. And there was a certain dynamic of it, of, um, we didn't, for example, like, uh, when we talked about like solidarity with the poor, mm-hmm. our, our like first guys, like, we didn't want to just like sit around a table and have like a talk about it. We're like, when it's rainy yeah. and it's cold, we're going to go do manual labor. Like this is, this is the type of thing. And so our initial formation was, there was a lot of work. There was silence, but it was mostly we're going to kick your butt and have you do a lot of work and manual labor and things like that. Yeah. Which I, for me is, I was really helpful. I think it was really formative. I'm, I'm grateful. That was my experience. That's awesome. Yeah. S- suppose this is a strange question. Suppose the friars had to disband tomorrow and you were no longer able to be a CFR. Yeah. If you had to choose a different religious order, who would you join? Okay. It's a religious order. Yeah, you can't. Okay, I can't be a Dawson priest. You can be a Dawson priest. That was my first, probably. I would be. I would probably be a Dawson priest. Yeah. It was, it was pretty strong CFR. Dawson priesthood was, op- the second choice. Um, I don't, 
Because I'm like, I'm just, I, I'm and, not dumb, but I'm not a Dominican. Like, I'm not, I couldn't go a full intellectual life like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I'm kind of like that too. I, I was with a couple of, uh, like, the, a couple of deans of the university yesterday, like yeah. a PhD in philosophy and theology. And I was sitting there, I was talking with them, and, and I thought, like, I actually don't have a desire to to do, there's a part of, I, like, I love the intellectual life, and I love thinking about deep things, but usually over a beer. Not like, yeah. how do you write 3,000 footnotes in your doctoral dissertation perfectly? Right. Like that, right. maybe I'm just not organized enough yeah. for that, but I'm glad people are doing it. But. Exactly, I value it, yeah. and I'm really grateful people are doing it, and I'm also grateful that it's, it's not, not my call. Yeah. yeah. Do you have some friars who, I mean, because there are a history of certain Franciscan friars who have obviously been towering intellects, Bonaventure, Anthony of Padua. Mm -hmm. Like, was there, is, are there people who join the Friars the Renewal and then maybe have a desire to go on to do further study or licentiates or? Yeah. Yeah. And so we do have a couple of those in the, in the works. And, and that would be a thing is like, we do have guys who are like, you know, Ivy Leagues. We have Brown, we have Yale, we have, so we have like. Yeah. Okay, cool. You know, and um, typically in seminary, we do quite well. Um, so we do value that side of things. And so we have one guy, we have a couple of guys who've gone on for like STLs. We have, a, you know, a canon lawyer. We have um, somebody who's working on his dissertation right now. Uh, so, so particularly because we became what's called a pontifical order, sort what of like the mean? full, it's kind of like the full maturity of religious order. Okay. And so far as um, at certain levels, really, really technically for a lot of levels, you're technically under the like archbishop where you're founded. Yeah. And so, um, for example, um, when we're going to go open a friary until we became pontifical, technically we needed the permission of the Cardinal Archbishop of New York. We need Cardinal Dolan's permission. I see. He's not going to get in like the business of that. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? But technically you do. And we became pontifical, which means you're official. You're under Rome, essentially the Holy gotcha. Father. Yeah. Kind of there's like, no middleman. In a yeah, sense. yeah. Yeah. Then you would seek the permission of the Bishop of the diocese you're entering or. I, well, yeah, we have to get invited by the yeah. Bishop. That's okay. 100. That's a very important thing. Yeah. Um, but part of that process is they encourage you to have certain degrees, certain capacities in house, such mm. as a canon lawyer. Cool. Yeah. And so that happened in 2016. We became pontifical, which, yeah, which means that this is a charism that's for the whole church. It's kind of like a, the final kind of like, yeah, this is final, final stamp of, of, of affirmation from, from the church about a charism. Yeah. What do you wish people would stop thinking about St. Francis of Assisi? <laughs> Okay, good question. <laughs> Let's do that. We there's a there's a lot of them. There's yeah. a lot of them, and but they all get to what I think is really fascinating if you go into his readings. So certainly it's like you know the bird bath thing, the bird bath thing, the hippie obvious, thing. Yeah. The uh, although the hippie thing is what drew me to him. I have to be honest. It was my false impression of <laughs> yeah. him that led me into him. Uh, that brother son sister moon kind yeah. of stuff. And same with me. I I read some of this sort of apocryphal things about his early found or early followers, which is probably not true at all. Cool. But that did like pique my interest. Yeah. Um, so I mean, or the, like certainly the Claire thing. Yeah. Tell us about it. What does that mean? So the, like, you know, if you watch a lot of the movies, like basically it's like Claire and Francis. Yeah. Claire and Francis were repressing this. Yeah. They were, longing in, for each other. they were in love and, um, you know, they sort of had that, like, you know, there, there was always this battle of like, Oh, should we be together or should we, they like, if you look at the rule, like the rule of St. Francis, one of them is like the friars should not enter convents unless for like particular need. A lot sure. of the writings are like, I don't think this is true, but like, like Francis, like didn't look women in the eye, things like that. Yeah. They're not, they weren't like going on picnics. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like from, they were, they were close and there was like a deep bond for sure. sure. It, it, but it doesn't this speak to our culture's yeah. inability to perceive friendship without sexual desires. Everything has to be sexualized. Yeah, we can't totally. possibly understand a man and a woman being friends. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, 100%. So that's like a silly one. The anti, like he was a, he was a son of the church and the idea that he, like he was kind of at odds somehow with like the hierarchy mm. is not at all Franciscan or St. Francis. But what's fascinating is like his writing, there's not a lot of writings. Okay. But in my mind, I'm like, I'm kind of like on a writings of St. Francis kick. Yeah. If you want to know St. Francis, look at his writings. Wow. Um, See, I don't know if I've done that. Almost I mean, nobody has. I, but that's so sad because I was somebody who actually discerned the friars, went and lived with them. I know that prayer about brother, son or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but I, yeah. So that's interesting. So why aren't there, why aren't there kind of publishers 
re, like you see up here, I've got all these kind of reproductions of Aquinas's works. Yeah. Why don't y'all get into the business about publishing Francis's works in more attractive packages? Well, probably. I mean, so it's not a lot. Okay. It's not. There's not a lot. If you were to put it into a book, like, would it be bigger than this? Smaller, much smaller. Yeah, much smaller than that. Um, it, it's like it would be the what the writings of Saint Francis we have something that's kind of smaller, cool. smaller. It's like this, but it's um, manageable. Yeah, and it's not, and that's the interesting thing is it's not. Um, it's like letters he wrote to the the, the they call the custodians, like the leaders of of a house, things mm-hmm. like that. Like they're not. It's it's a very targeted audience, but um, in almost all of them, he's talking about he's reminding the clergy or he's reminding his brothers about receiving the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ with dignity. It's, it's so Eucharistic. Really? And wherever the brothers are there to preach to everyone in every sermon, they're to preach penance and to remind the faithful that, um, you have to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's just so Eucharistic. Wow. Wow. And that, that almost never gets talked about with St. Francis. Yeah. Yeah. I know Bonaventure has got those gorgeous prayers prior before and after mass and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then i think he was all because he, he was a contemporary of aquinas and was asked to help you know, maybe compose some hymns for the feast of corpus christi yeah yeah but uh, so there you go that's awesome because there really is a strong devotion of the eucharist in your community for sure like i can't see a picture of the friars you know or like you look at you gave me this lovely book this morning and y'all are bowing down towards the blessed yeah, sacrament yeah. and so that's cool so you're really inspired in that sense by that yeah and and that is the heart of our life and that's the heart of our prayer and we make you know eucharistic holy hour uh, every evening together. Um, and I do hope that's like, and that's, that's the thing probably with St. Francis for ourselves. Like we don't want to be known so much for like being cool or being fun or being poor, but we do want to be men of prayer and men of the Eucharist. And, and, awesome. and, and, and that is, um, there is though a cool vibe about y'all that, that Father Pine doesn't have. Let's just, <laughs> let's just state that emphatically. <laughs> I mean, he's cool in like a I'm into D and D kind of uh-huh. way, but he's not cool like you might be part of a biker gang. So is it merely the beards? Is it the it's the kind of rough living? It's the, what is it that makes you guys so it, attractive? Because there's something to that. Yeah. I mean, just like you know, when I was first attracted to my wife, it wasn't the most profound things. It yeah. was like she's pretty, and yeah. it was the exteriors. And I think in a way, <laughs> yeah. people are attracted at first to become a friar of the new because of the exteriors and yeah. hopefully that leads into something deeper absolutely but. and that was funny right when we went and got uh, coffee this morning the yeah the the and and mentioned oh, hey ann how are you maybe she's watching it later uh but yeah. she mentioned like the yeah. cfrs are like the biker That's like right. the biker gang of the franciscans <laughs> she mentioned like a couple of those she knew i'm like i'm a country club kid i'm like not i'm like definitely not i'm, I'm not tough yeah. um and the other guys she mentioned are like very clean cut uh, kids uh but uh, I think it's probably it's probably a combination of a couple of things. Number one is um, living with and sharing our lives with the poor does add a certain dynamic. Like there is just a certain feel when you are with people from like you know the South Bronx or from yeah. Harlem. You know, like there's just a certain vibe, and uh, and that does become part of our own life. That's right. You know, you're fa- not just sharing your life with them; they're sharing their life with yours, and it influences you. Exactly, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. And um, or like I just, you know, if you're with kids from like the projects, right? Like in the Bronx, like they're gonna, you can't, you know, you can't talk to them up here. Like they're gonna, you know, and you pick up though some of like just their style, but also things like you know, so so we don't have like the internet, we don't have TV, and so Sorry. part of how we um like our recreation really is. It's it's not like um, us looking at something else. It's it's us looking at each other. Like it's doing things together, Man. and part of that, I think, helps to develop some sort of social skills and some fun, and also just the fact that like we there is that whole Franciscan like we're not there's space for being unique. There's space for being yourself, and like we're not uh, telling you how to whatever part your hair yeah. or whatever you know. And so part <laughs> of that does yeah. Um, well, you have to it. shave it off, I guess, which is it, why you can't part it. But even that, technically, you don't have to do. Really? So we have some guys with some hair. Yeah. We got Renegades. Some <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Punks. Um, what's, you know, so we have a... I want the Babylon Bee to do a... You know what that is. Yeah. Uh, even though you don't have the internet. I want the Babylon Bee to do a story about a friar... Of, not that they're Catholic. A friar of the renewal who couldn't grow a beard and so had to become a legionary of Christ. Because mm-hmm. he could do a wicked part. That's right. <laughs> What's what's interesting now is we can that's often a question is like what's up with the beards, and now we can say, 
uh, we grow beards so we don't become bishops because we have one one of our founders who always had basically normal hair. He had hair here, no beard, <laughs> and he was made a uh, auxiliary bishop oh. of Chicago. So if you look a little rough, they won't maybe yeah, exactly. turn to you. Yeah, exactly. It is a cool thing. I mean, it's funny, like you guys were doing beards before it was hipster and cool, but mm -hmm. there is something uh, neat about it. Like even, even just, I mean, if it were me and I had become a friar and kind of, it would it would make the immediate sort of temptation to flirt or even to go down the path to say breaking my vows or fornication a lot yeah. it kind of it puts a barrier there if you look like a homeless person yeah is that okay that i said that i don't know person don't, who is homeless <laughs> is that better ah i i think not um, everyone who's homeless okay you go i know what you mean up. i yeah. know what you mean um there is a dynamic of being you don't homeless look homeless you understand what i'm saying you look fine Thank you. Crap. That's not what I'm going for, though. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't like. I don't look in the mirror and think, "Oh yeah, I look, I look, I look sharp today." You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's not that's not a factor I'm too worried about. Yeah. Luckily, um, the there is a. I think there's a part of that that it. My 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 thing with the beard is twofold. Is um, there it's good. Well, I'll, I guess I go with the first one. It's good to sort of when you especially like in sort of like ministry of like mercy stuff, it's good to just kind of be very clear to people that you're kind of like living by different values and you're making different judgments. And and I think people sort of receive that kind of like by like osmosis. And there's, there's a tendency to be like, okay, he's not going to, he's not going to judge me based off all this other stuff. I can just kind of be myself totally. and I can just be honest. Yeah. And I do think the funny look does sort of create a, a space to be a little it's bit nice. more yeah. open. And I imagine like if I was somebody who was poor and you lived in my area, if I learned that, oh, you don't have the internet, like y'all like only wear that and you sleep on the floor, like that would be very impressive to me. You're not just someone who comes into a community who's basically living like yeah. everybody in yeah. middle class suburbia. Yeah. But yeah, but that, that even that only goes so far. Okay. Because if you're if you if you like live with them and you live simply and sleep on the floor, but you're a jerk, that's exactly right. They're it's not like, going to yeah. be impressed. Just because you don't have a bed doesn't mean you're exactly. immune to being yeah. a jerk. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they don't really care that you don't have the internet if like you don't have time for them either. Mm. And so that that's and even that's kind of what we need to form our men in, like the the poverty and the austerity and that stuff. Because there's a temptation to kind of uh, idolize that, isn't there? One hundred percent. Especially, I mean, that was my thing. Like I heard the guys sleep on the floor and it's like, okay, I want to do that. So for for the young men, which is fine, we can start there. The exteriors and that stuff kind of has pride of place often. And so part of the formation is going deeper. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Like, I know you're a smart guy. You wrote this book and everything. But it is funny that, like, when we have Father Pine, like, divine simplicity. And for the last 20 minutes, we've been talking about beards. Yeah. <laughs> sleeping on the yeah. floor. <laughs> I, I, I'm more comfortable here. Yeah. Well, and, you know, again, like, I... Th we we had uh we've talked about father pine a little bit because i i was at franciscan with him and i just i heard him on your on some i don't know if it was it was probably an interview you did with him you've done a couple now and i just heard him talk <laughs> and i was like i'm never speaking again it was kind of like that <laughs> yeah. but it was like i don't necessarily <laughs> and i have like i have like i have like i'm educated i have a couple master's degrees and this stuff yeah and but still i was like i don't necessarily know everything that he just said <laughs> But it was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> but it was beautiful. He speaks like he's reading poetry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. His his lexicon is like just it's it it is incredible, and I'm really grateful he's on my team. So when you had him on your YouTube videos, yeah. were you just like, so what about the scapula? And you're like, I'm just gonna shut up, and <laughs> <laughs> let him go. <laughs> that's that's kind of what I do. Yeah, that's kind of what yeah. I do. But because yeah, and I, I basically when I reached out to him about that, I gave him like here's the one, the questions that we want to answer from somebody who like knows what they're talking about. Yeah. So can you handle these ones? Yeah. That's nice. And he was good. That's nice. It's a beautiful, isn't it? Who, who, def who defined the church as here comes everyone. Yeah. Somebody. Yeah. But I like that. Yeah. You know, it's like, we got, we gotta, we gotta love the poor and we gotta, we want to reach out to those who are skeptical and who are, you know, in academia and yeah, I, that, that's another kick of mine. I am just, I am, I know a lot of people are probably struggling right now with Catholicism in the church and it, but I, I am so, I just, I love the church and I'm so deeply convinced of like the beauty of the church and the reasonability of our faith. And just like, if you want, if you want to have, if you want to go intellectual and you want to talk about divine simplicity and you want to go that route, we can hang. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to go and talk about like working with the poor and living in the slums and things like that, like we're there. It's just, 
what God has done through the church and where we are, like it, it is, it's, I, I mean, I know it's a bit of a cliche and a, and a false one to say people aren't converted by apologetics. They're converted by the heart. I, I get that that's false, but there's still some truth to it. It's almost like your way of life and the things that the friars devote themselves to, or if you think of a different religious order, the, the, the Mother Teresa's nuns, mm -hmm. it almost like circumvents the head mm -hmm. and it goes right at the guts yeah. and you're just, it's like, I haven't seen people live like this. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know where it is in Acts where he says... Um, well, actually, I don't even know what it says. So it doesn't matter. But something like, you know, come and see. Come, come and see how, I mean, Christ said that. But like, yeah. see how we live. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. that is such a witness to people. Yeah. I mean, that's what I was just saying earlier in Rome. Like, I'm looking at these people. I'm like, who are you? You don't have to be drunk. None of you are having sex. You've actually told me that you you think you should save it till marriage, which is weird because you could totally get some because you're attractive. I'm not. I get why I have to be absent. You could. And yet, you know, and that, that witness to me mm -hmm. almost like opened me up to like, okay, now I'm ready to listen. I think yeah. Pope Paul VI said something like that. Modern man listens uh, more readily to witnesses than teachers or something to that effect. But if he listens yeah. to teachers, it's because they're first witnesses. Right. You guys do that great. Yeah. Trying. Yeah. We're trying, but and and I think I think you said it well. Is you, you we want both though, like the intellectual side of our faith and our life is very important, you know. So it's not just that we sort of can be good listeners and and work with the poor, but our like the intellectual side of our faith is deeply important as well. Hmm. And so we, um, and and we can't all do everything as well as we might want that's so important to understand but that's but part of the beauty of the church though is that we do someone have, can yeah not everybody has to think about these things yeah. but somebody does right and I so that. yeah so the dominicans who are there you know this is i actually love this about the church you know paul says i'll be i want to be i've become old to old men yeah. or it feels like the church is sort of like yeah. that in a way yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah that's awesome man um you wrote a book called habits for holiness how what was that writing the book what was that process like for you have you written a lot before did it come easily um, the answer is no. Um, on both accounts? On both accounts. Well, on, on sort of, <clears throat> I'll, um, I'll kind of explain is, so I actually pitched Ascension, basically this coffee table book. This, yeah. Can you just do a show up on this here? I don't know where, where should I point it? At the camera or this one? Yeah. Maybe turn, yeah, look at that. So father just gave me this book and I am so grateful, man. I, I can't wait to look through it. You guys do a great job again. Thank you. Anyway, you were saying. So so I pitched Ascension on a version of a coffee table book because okay. we had one that came out called Drama of Reform. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, Back about in 20 the day, years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I like pictures yeah. are powerful. And like, I remember being a novice and we had one of the, like this Mother Teresa coffee table book. And if I needed like, just like a, a shot in the arm, like a little extra something, I'd just go look at that book. <laughs> And, and the publisher kind of refers to it as like a retreat in images. And I think there's something to that. Like there's just something this about- This is beautiful. This, yeah. We got this fry here praying the Jesus prayer. Yeah. Um, and we have, we just, God has sent some unbelievable photographers our way. There's this kid, Martin Jernberg. New York City is a place for yeah. all sorts of talent. Yeah. 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 So you were saying, sorry. So there's this kid, Martin Jernberg, who, who came around for a while. And he's probably in his like, he's probably about 24 at this point, but he's unbelievable. He's unbelievable. And so a lot of these pictures are, are from him. <sighs> Um, but anyway, I pitched them on the, this idea and they basically said, no, how's it smell? <laughs> I love to smell yeah. books. It smells lovely. Yeah. I'd buy it just for that. I need a candle that smells like that. Just like, which I guess would new, be new book. plastic. New book. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So you pitched them on this. Why did they say no? I think because there was a, it was kind of like supposed to be like story based. Like we're going to tell stories of our life. And for a sense presents, those don't really work. And so I think they were like, that doesn't really work. Yeah. But then they kind of came back like, well, how about like a book on poverty or on simplicity for the lady? Because that's kind of taken off like minimalism. This it has, woman, yeah. uh, I think it's Marie or Maria Kondo. Okay. Do you know who that is? Don't know. She's like a very popular, like you take all your stuff, put it on your bed and pick it up and say if this gives you joy or not and if it doesn't oh the get asian woman yeah yeah she's lovely yeah, yeah. i've seen a couple of videos of her and thought gosh she's so beautiful <laughs> and it's really like it's popular There's wisdom in that too yeah eh? yeah and so i was like so they kind of basically wanted to propose like a catholic version of that okay and i said um okay that's part of our life i don't know if that's like a whole book yeah but c could we sort of flesh out more of our life and have that be a chapter 
And so the idea of, of this, the working title of the book was the Franciscan option. Yeah. Have you, have you, are you familiar kind yeah, of with that? I'm glad you didn't go with that. It just yeah, feels yeah, like yeah, yeah. too many people are doing this option. Yeah, everyone's yeah, yeah. kind of riffing off that book. Well, <laughs> I like this more. Well, the marketing team at Ascension chose this title. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they're on the same page as But you. yeah, I read the Benedict option. I think it's excellent. Yeah. yeah. But the idea was, because um, this is, and this is, <clears throat> so this is like our, essentially like our way of following Jesus in the midst of a crazy world. Beautiful. Breaking it down and then how it's possible for lady. Because I do think that uh, for a lot of people, they look at the world. And so I kind of tell the story. I'll just kind of start yeah, real yeah. quick. Is is um, when we started in the South Bronx in 87, it was that area was known as Fort Apache or kind of like the precinct there okay. because of the drugs, because of the violence, because of all that. And um, I think when people look at the world and the, even, yeah, it can feel like a big war zone and there can yeah. be like, is it even possible? And there can be a lot of temptation, I think, to discourage me. Yeah, totally. And um, most people aren't going to just like, totally check out of society and like kind of move to a farm. And right. so the idea is like, okay, hey, like I, we understand this is hard, but we have a whole patrimony and tradition of following Jesus in the midst of the craziness. It's possible. Basically like holiness is possible. doesn't happen by accident. It's possible. You got to want it, but it's possible. And here's like, here's a game plan. Here's what it can look like. Um, Cause I do even think in my own work, you do meet a lot of people who are like super sincere and they want to follow Jesus radically. Yeah. They have kids, they have jobs, they have all that. And they just don't really know what it looks like. And so this is just, I was trying to kind of help do some of the work of like, here's, here's how you do it. Yeah. That's awesome. So uh, the, we, you know, we just moved to, to Steubenville mm -hmm. in January and the, the re the kind of way in which that came about was somebody invited us to discern moving to a big plot of land in Tyler, Texas. Good friends of ours. They mm -hmm. just bought 500 and something acres. I really think the Lord is at work in this in mm -hmm. this movement that they're mm -hmm. doing. First thing they're doing is building an oratory. Yeah. And then, you know, it's That's beautiful. The, it's like the very Yes, yeah, Veritata like, Splendor. Yeah, yeah. It's so cool that you know that, right? Because me, my wife, and the Beckmans, we're sitting having a glass of wine. Like, I think this is what the Lord's calling them to. Mm -hmm. You know, like they, they mm -hmm. were telling us this original mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. I flew down, I got into a private plane of this really beautiful wealthy man we went and saw the property we were driving around on a four-wheeler bishop strickland in the front his cape blowing up in my face this is amazing uh -huh. and uh, <laughs> we, you know he blessed the property and it couldn't have been more beautiful i mean i gotta give you ah oh man i guess uh, 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 this is a beautiful story right so we're just praying lord is this is this your will that mm -hmm. we do we do this and we've got this one woman with us uh, Janice, her name was. And Janice is one of these like old school charismatic types, but like legit loves our Lord, right? And so she's praying with this other woman. She's like, well, let's just pray and we'll ask the Lord to give us an image, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they pray. And the other woman, kind of like me, she's like playing it safe, maybe. <laughs> so Janice is like, what's the, what's the Lord like? What's he giving you? And the, and the lady's like, just peace, just getting peace. Oh, I got... Pin the tail on the donkey and <laughs> mushrooms. Like, what the hell is that? That's what Janice said? Yeah, yeah, right? And so that morning, we get into a car. She's telling us a story. We haven't been to the land yet. We know nothing about this potential land. We show up, driving around on this four-wheeler, blessing the land. And Janice uh, finds out that there's animals on this property, like zebras, believe it or not, and a donkey. And that donkey doesn't have a tail because that one ate it. Which is weird. That's uh -huh, the story we got uh -huh. told. It was like, oh my goodness, that's <laughs> weird. And Janice is like, do you guys have any mushrooms on this property? And they assured her that no, they, we don't have any mushrooms on this property. And But within a few minutes, we saw this tree covered with mushrooms. And I was like, all right. <laughs> that's amazing how the Lord speaks to some <laughs> yeah, people. You know? yeah. Whereas I'm like, I just get this sense of peace. Uh -huh, you know, like uh -huh. you can't really disprove that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but anyway, so I was there and I, and I looked at Carrie Beckman, who's kind of spearheading this. And yeah. I'm like, I don't think the Lord's calling me to this. Yeah. And I had this just strong sense that this wasn't what the Lord was calling me to. I have no doubt the Lord is calling people there. And I think it's glorious and beautiful. But one of the lovely things I love about living in France, Steubenville, mm -hmm. is I can go from like saying hi to a prostitute on the street legitimately, although you're in the Bronx, so nothing kind of shocks you, I guess, but might shock some people, you know, saying hi to a homeless guy and then seeing a group of nuns walking down the road praying mm -hmm. the rosary together. Mm -hmm. Like we were driving down the road and my wife mm -hmm. thought, <laughs> yeah. you probably heard this, thought they were like inmates doing 
doing like community service because <laughs> they had these like tan suits on and then she looked again these were the nuns they were nuns <laughs> in the rosary but to your point right like i think there's something lovely well i think there is something we should really be nervous about or cautious about if we feel like we're meant to like go to a property start a bunch of lands isolate ourselves off from everybody not interact with the world or evangelize that's not I'm not saying that's what Retire Splendor are doing. They're not doing that. Mm-hmm. They have a real mission to evangelize, right? Yeah. Um, and to kind of form people to go out. Yeah. So uh, don't anyone hear me say that. But there is something beautiful about like a natural community here in Steubenville. Mm-hmm. Like I know my five neighbors and all of them are Catholic, yeah. regular mass goers. I've got Carmelites who live across yeah. the street from me. And it's rough. It's a rougher area. Maybe it looks great to you from the Bronx. I don't know. <laughs> But I went to Cleveland the other day. I'm like, wow, this is what a nice city looks mm-hmm, like. You know, mm-hmm. Steubenville's kind of run down. Yeah. But to your point about this Franciscan option, about like living in the midst of the world, and and in no way does this community feel artificial. It just feels like, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. I'm just so honored and blessed and thrilled that I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 I think it, it's good to know, and I think you did it well, is just that, um, for example, like the, what's it called? Veritas of Splendor? Yeah. Like there is like 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 there is a, a place in the church for Benedictines, right? Mm-hmm. There is a place in the church for That's right. for a yeah. little bit of a more removed life. Yeah. Um, and again, no, none of them are like we're just gonna like hide out and just stay hidden. It's like we're gonna kind of form form this culture and then kind of engage. But I think though, in today's day and age, where it feels like everything is on fire, yeah. and there's nothing that's yeah. gonna put it out. Yeah. That's the sense I get. Yeah. It just feels like America's on flames and there's no coming yeah. back. That's yeah. how I feel, yeah. and I think that feeling is sh- shared by many people. One hundred percent. And um, that's when it's scary to be like, "Well, let's go start a yeah. little group over here." Yeah. yeah. Um, even if you are called to that, it's like, oh man, it's it's anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, one hundred percent. And and I don't think it's you can't just be like, "Oh, you don't have to do that." Like there is there is some discernment, and sometimes like like a lot of public schools are just getting crazy. You know what I mean? And, and and there is a there is a place where it's like okay we have to do Get our out own of thing. there. Yeah, I think one hundred percent. Yeah, um, but but it's not necessarily like okay we have to pull out from everything that is. Yeah, yeah you know what I mean? Because I think like as a parent, like I'm I'm, I'm aware of that, right? Like I want to protect my kids. Like one of the biggest wounds ever inflicted upon me was pornography as a kid. You know, and it's almost I feel like whatever whatever a child whatever a parent uh, most regrets from his or her childhood they want to see to it that their child doesn't have to regret that thing (laughs) and so it almost becomes the litmus test for am i doing a good job as a parent and you and and you can but you can fall into the trap of like raising your children to be in this continual defensive crouch as i heard one person put it against the culture Mm -hmm. as opposed to recognizing the the good the true and the beautiful that's mixed in you know yeah it's a a scary job being a parent yeah how's that going uh, I, I love my kids so much. Um, what are their ages? It didn't come to me naturally. Eh? Being a parent did not come yeah. to me naturally. Uh, they're 13 down to six. Okay. You know, I, I, birth of my first children and everyone else I met was like, wow, what a joy it is, hey? I'm like, I hate this. <laughs> I can't sleep. I feel like I've lost my wife. I No time is my own. Like, I know I shouldn't not like this, but this is excruciating for me. Mm-hmm. It was a really lonely experience because mm-hmm. I'd always like... I'd meet people that are about to have their first child. I like, just know, like it's it's going to be really tough, and that's okay. I like, come back five yeah. months later, like it's not tough at all. I'm like, now to be fair, we lived in Ireland with yeah. no family, very few friends, freezing cold house. We were a bit new parents, like it was tough. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I don't know. So it was didn't come to me naturally. Mm-hmm. I think I was like, okay, I get the basics of theology of the body. Like I'm not screwing around. I'm not like I got this. And I did not realize just how terribly selfish I was. Mm-hmm. Still, I'm sure, I have no idea. And so nothing like parenthood where, yeah. where you've got these little humans in your house who mm-hmm. do not care. You know, Don't pick up on your social cues to be left alone. Just right. keep coming. Right. Maybe it's like the poor. It's like the environment. You know, yeah. I don't, I'm not saying that I'm not comparing the poor to children, but like people have needs. Yep. And they're not terribly interested if you have something else to do. And yeah. Yeah. That's been a real blessing for me. Yeah. And it's only it's taken me about 15 years to figure that out, <laughs> that this hey, is a blessing. It, but you did it, right? Well, or you're Lord, doing it. The Lord's doing yeah. it, man. He's, he's bringing all the threads together for my good. So here's an interesting thing, like doing ministry a lot, is one of the things that people often share is like, oh, I had this difficult experience at home. 
and now and then the Lord broke into it in this way. Yeah. Like wh- as a parent, the idea that like kids are still going to get like wounded. How do you it's, reconcile or what do you well, do Well, I, I said this the other day in a live stream. I, after the birth of my first child, Liam, who I love, he's a terrific child. I rang up my best mate's dad, Mark Bennett, his name was from Australia. I called his dad Shane. I said, Shane, were you ever afraid of screwing up your kids? And he said, oh, no. I would hate to have to, pri- to deprive them of healing. It's mm. <laughs> a nice answer. Yeah. So I tell you, man, you just, you know, it's one of these things where you realize like you actually could be a perfect parent and your child could still be wounded because they misinterpreted how you said something. You know, you you talk to people now and they're like, one day my dad came and he said this and just shamed me. Mm -hmm. And like that colored their childhood. And it's like a big part of the thing they're trying to overcome. And it could be that your father said something sinful or had a bad attitude or or did something cruel. It could be that he didn't. Maybe you just misinterpret it. So mm-hmm. it's like, I don't know, yeah. just just trying to trust in our Lord and say, Lord Jesus, I love you. And I thank you that my, you, you've given me my children, but you've also given them me with all of my flaws and my impatience and my imperfections and the times I shout at them and then have to apologize. All of that. I just trust you, Lord, that you're going to use all for their good. That's it. Almost like I, I can't see with my natural eyes, you know, mm-hmm. just got to be like, I trust in you, Lord. And you're going to do good things, you know, yeah. so. I believe that. Yeah, but that's, so, but that's uh, that only that un, that wisdom. I can only hear that wisdom when me and the Lord are well. Yeah. When I'm well with Him. Yeah. But if I'm frantic and anxious and not praying and not in that place, then everything seems like it could be terrible and disastrous mm-hmm. and falling mm-hmm. apart. Mm-hmm. So, uh, can I ask you another question? Sure. <laughs> I feel like I've picked up on some of your talking. There is there like a Byzantine. So for the so, yeah, we went to a business church for the last six years. Okay. In Atlanta, um, there's a whole story there. Um, now that we're here in Steubenville, you know, we had the chance. Do we want to live outside five, ten acres? You know, maybe have a little homestead thing. That would have been a terrible idea. I got no idea how to uh-huh. barely use duct tape. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we chose to live in town. Like we wanted to be yeah. amidst people and doing life. Walk over to friends' houses and things like this. Um, so we also just decided, you know, let's go to let's go to St. Pete's up the road and just sort of rediscover the heritage mm-hmm. of the West. Mm-hmm. That's kind of where we're at right now. Excellent. But yeah, for the last six years though in yeah. Atlanta, we were going to a lovely Byzantine church. And we it's joyful. Yeah. But you didn't grow up in that. No. Okay. Okay. Good. I guess I just, picked up on some things. Yeah, that, I did a deep dive. Yeah. And the Jesus prayer. Love the Jesus prayer. Praying yeah. it this morning. Yeah. I just see. Here's a cool little prayer rope you've probably never seen before. I think it's called a Lestrovka. It's like an old Russian. I have never seen this before. Isn't that cool? That, I don't get stumped on a regular basis. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> when people say, oh, you've probably never seen this. Before. Yeah, well, tell me about this. I think it's Russian for ladder. Uh, Lestro- I might be getting that word wrong. That. Maybe Lestrovka is what you say when you cheers people with a glass of vodka. Yeah. I might have that entirely wrong. But yeah, it's just basically a prayer rope. It's the Jesus prayer. So there's these like old Russian believers that had certain traditions and customs prior to the time the Orthodox Church in Russia sought to kind of maybe conform themselves in certain ways to the rest of the Orthodox world. Mm-hmm. They pray, they you know, make the sign of the cross even more differently. Like I so said, that we in the Byzantine Church, you would make the sign of the cross like right. that. But they had always been making it like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was a big deal. And so they kind of broke away in some sense. Anyway, I don't know. So that's just to say, I love the Jesus prayer. Yeah, I love. And one of the things I've been doing now. Do you the, see the Jesus prayer on that? Is that yeah, what this is? That's okay. what it's for. Yeah. Okay. But I'll um, even just switch up the kind of, you know, I t- today I was just sitting in church just, and all I was saying, I was breathing in and saying, uh, I am yours. You are mine. Mm. I am yours. You are mine. Just from that Song of Songs chapter two, yeah. I am my beloved's, he is mine. Yeah. Just sit and look at him. Like, I love you, and I love that you love me, and I'm so grateful that you love me. I so like that. Yeah. I like but it's, that. it's lovely, you know? Like, I mean, we live in an anxious time, and sometimes I find that I'm forgetting to breathe deeply. You find yourself kind of breathing a little more shallowly. Shallowly? I don't know. Mm-hmm. More shallowly. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I just like to just, yeah, just breathe in all the way and breathe yeah. out. It's lovely. Do you know Catherine Doherty? I know of her. Okay. Yeah, I actually have been up to... No, no, I haven't been to Catherine Do- Is it the one in ca- up in Canada? Madonna House. Yeah, I've Canada. been there. Yeah. And there was that kind of... She was a Russian immigrant. Yeah. Yeah. Because we use her 
um, do you know like the whole like Pustinia, Pustinic tradition? We built one in the back of our house in Atlanta. Did you? Pustinia, yeah. Well, like, was it just like a kind of a... We got one of those wooden sheds yeah. delivered to our... We had five acres on our back property. Got a couple... Of, we built a little deck on the front of it, put two rocking chairs, nailed some icons into the wall. Yeah. And it was just available if people wanted to come spend 24 hours. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. we, we have a tradition for, for ourselves, the friars. We have a... We call it a hermitage. But basically every month, the friar takes like a personal retreat. That's nice. Which is essentially... <laughs> A lot of it is kind of like a Pustinia. Yeah, type Pustinia experience. is Russian for desert. For mm-hmm. those who are watching, and so it's just a way to yeah retreat. Yeah, and be so, alone. And so we use her her book on that kind of as like a cool. I've never read introduction it. to it. I like it a lot. I like it a lot, a lot. She's really um, Catherine Doherty is a rock star. She's yeah. powerful. Yeah, I got that sense. No nonsense. Yeah, I mean, her she was married, and then her and her husband took vows of celibacy. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have. It's funny. Um, so we have we have uh, two brothers. So they're biological brothers who are yeah. both friars. Did I? Was that the interview I did? No, we have. So he's a triplet. Oh, that's so. Right. Father Angelus, his <laughs> his brother, his so his uh, he's a triplet. One other brother and then one sister, and uh, the sister's married with a bunch of kids. Lives out in, that's right. in uh, Nebraska. Nebraska, exactly. And his brother is my superior, Father Innocent. So yeah. they all they all live together. But there's a different set of brothers. The best brothers is, is their last name, and they were both. Um, Hang on, what's their last name? Best. That's li- <laughs> it's literally the best. And they're they're studs. They're they're. Uh, wow. They were both professional poker players. Wow. Before they joined, uh, cool. which is a kind of a whole interesting story how their vocations happen. But one of them sort of, I don't know. Do you know anything about online poker? No, I know my brother plays it. The okay. End. There was there was there was a phase where like because they're they. I don't know how it got worked out, but you could play in the States, but I don't know. They're like offshore servers or something like oh. that because of the law. And there's a point where like everyone's account and I'm like three or four different of the big ones, their accounts got frozen because whatever the government was cracking down and wow. trying to regulate. And so one of the brothers, um, he had like 30 grand that got frozen that he didn't know if he'd ever see again. And the Lord was already working in his heart. And uh, so he went out to Madonna House mm. and spent some time there. And it, it, it was really funny because... <laughs> Tell people what that is because you and I know what it is. But Yeah. So I'm going to do my best. I yeah. don't, I'm not an expert on it. My understanding is it's some it's somewhat of like uh, living off the land. Yep. Right? So it's a, it's a number. It's a, it's a mixed group, men and women. I think there's yep. priests as well. They live off the land. They live very, very simply. In community with each other. In community. They have... Um, what, like the Pustinias yeah. or they like they make times of, of hermitage or prayer. Yeah. And so I think it's kind of like common living, working the land. I got praying. a friend who just took final vows there several several okay. years back. We were close. She was discerning, becoming a nun and then yeah. ended up doing that. It seems sort of like a um what would it like kind of like a a semi monastic way yeah. of life yeah, that I includes think so. laity. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh so he was there, he's a city boy, Philly area. And it's funny because like the Lord is working on his heart and he just was like, he hated everything about it. It was really funny. It was really funny. He hated everything about it, but it was like, it was uh, like when he got there, but it was like too hard to leave because like in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) So he just kind of like stuck it out. And and over his time there, um, like kind of grace got in there and his his vocation was born and mm. so um we've had we've had at least two guys who've come come through the madonna house and again it's just a there, so it's nice. amazing what can happen when you do check out for a little bit when you get yeah. off the grid for a little bit yeah. and you give god space so. you know um i think older people like myself and yourself look at younger people and think gosh you're, you're completely hooked on these things but as somebody like yourself who doesn't have the internet doesn't have, mm-hmm. are you do, I, I would imagine you're in a position to see the addiction yeah. more than others because it just becomes commonplace for us. You're chatting mm-hmm. with someone, they pick up their phone, they start looking at it. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, that's different because yeah. I'm here. Yeah. But yeah. okay. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel that more? Do you think other people do? Do you see it? Perhaps. So I'm in a, I'm like slightly unique as a friend because I'm our director of communications. Ah. And so I do, like we have an office in the Bronx that has the internet. Gotcha. So it's, it's not in the friaries. It's not in you the friaries. You have to leave that place to go to your office. Correct. That's, that's really cool that you don't make, hopefully, don't make exceptions, right? Where it's like, well, we have an office in the friary where you can use the internet because yeah. then it's like, well, we have the yep. internet now. Yeah, and and I think, um, yeah, so like you would go to like the public library or something like that. That that would be like where a standard brother would go. Okay. And there's, I've, I've kind of been, because there was discussions about whether or not like, 
do we want to stick with this? Like what's, why are we doing this? Things like that, you know? Um, Because there is an inconvenience factor, especially as the world is just so connected on that. But for, for us, we've just done, I think the arguments against having the internet and the friary are just, yeah, we're, it's just, it, it, so it would happy. hurt our, it would just, it would hurt our life I a lot. I pray that you guys never, yeah. never get it. Yeah. And it's just like, it's just too, it's important for us when life's hard to stay checked in, to stay, stay, stay in it, you know? And it's just too, yeah. it's just too easy to have yeah. this kind of like other controlled world and uh, to just get distracted and things like that. Um, but so I, I, I am on a little bit more than most friars and to like probably a lot more than most friars. But I think that is a beautiful thing about the, there's, there's a, um, in the rule of St. Francis, he has this line, the brothers are not to look down on those who wear fine clothes and eat like, eat like rich foods. And, and I'm going to apply that like principle to the media thing. But there is just a sense of like, okay, you have, you have a vocation and you have a particular charism and gift that you've received. Don't, don't become a jerk because of it. And so I don't, I think we have that spirit within us. And so like when we do see people who, who are on the internet or who are doing things, like hopefully our spirit isn't like critical and like you're an idiot, turn it off. Like, um, so hopefully we don't have that. But I do think we, as somebody who's like in it a little bit and also out of it, you do see the ways in which it does try and draw you in. Like, yeah. It, yeah. I was, uh, <clears throat> we were sitting on my back deck in Atlanta. A good friend of mine, Emily Blaisdell, one of the most beautiful creatures God's made. We were just sitting around, my wife, her, a few other people, and I got a book in my lap, you know, I'm reading a bit and we're chatting and she, you know, she, her cell phone's dinging and she's yeah. looking at it. I'm like, do you, do you mind? Like, can we, can we put, can we be together? And she said, well, you have a book in your uh-huh. lap and you're looking at it. What's the difference? Uh-huh. And we both knew that there was one, yeah. but we had to articulate it and we thought about it and we were like, here it is. I act on the book, the book, the phone acts on us, mm-hmm. right? So the Mm -hmm. phone is the one calling out to you and bothering you and pulling you in. I'm the one who has to actively look at the pages. So it's it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to be present with it. It's very different. It's very different. It's very different. Um, I I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but after this interview, I'm going to go home, hang out with my bride. I'd love you to meet my wife. I've met her. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, if you want to hang out, we can get lunch or something. Thank you, yeah. Um, but I'm actually, my wife's good enough. She's allowing me to go on a retreat. And by retreat, I mean a friend's cabin on a lake. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to go there for three nights. But I'm going to leave my phone and I'm going to leave my computer. And I have like the map feature on my car and I'm going to take, take a flip phone. I need to do that. I cannot relax with this stuff around. Yeah. I may, <clears throat> part of me wants to say I don't have the willpower to say, I'm going to bring it and leave it in the car. But I think it's almost gotten to the point when I don't know if many of us have that willpower. It's like, it's such that it's so easy to go down a rabbit trail. Yeah. So I'm going to leave it and I'm going to take a book with me and I'm yeah. just going to smoke cigars, drink coffee, pray to Jesus yeah. and sit. Yeah. I'm so excited to sit. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's a really <laughs> good there. observation, distinction, judgment. Cause I don't know that we, I, it, there's, it's like, it's like a willpower hack. Like it's just like, it's exactly. gotten in, in a way and we're compromised yeah 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 and and i think we just it's 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 better and probably more true to say like okay i need i need i need some boundary with this thing other than just i'm gonna make right decisions totally i'm gonna gonna will the good all the time i i try to leave my phone and computer here on the weekend so i'll go home it's amazing like three seconds out of the door i'm touching my phone because i thought i need to check email i didn't wonder if um but it you slow down and it's not there anymore it's yeah it's uh because the thing is like if i take and i say this to those who are watching because you might want to do something similar you know like if i took my phone and my computer home so i'm just going to keep it in the drawer i'm not gonna yeah but the thing is it's so easy but like i just need to send that one email that i forgot to and i need to if it's not there i actually can't do it yeah. but if it's there i open it up and then i'm on youtube and then i go down this trail yeah. and then yeah. my piece uh, evaporates yeah. <laughs> so yeah and that, and that's something that we talk about that I'm because again I do have more access to these things than most friars, and so when there are conversations about kind of having more internet access, one of the things like you don't want to surrender too easily, like um, the gift of not having a bunch of emails. <laughs> like when you when you know what I mean like Dude. when you ha- when you have two hundred emails or something like that, like it's just the, it's the worst. It's the worst. It really is. And so like if you can avoid that, we want to avoid that. You know what I mean? It's just, it is. And, and they like the range, it's a fascinating thing. I'm sure there's been studies on it. Like 
the range of emotions that you can have to experience in like 10 minutes of going through emails of like, 100%. you know, I mean, getting some criticism or getting some hard thing over here or it's some you. new work or some crisis, some affirmation. It's just like, you never know. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's just, it's a great way to steal your peace. It's, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, like, uh, I, I, I rant about this all the time, so people will forgive me or they won't, but you know, as a kid, if you wanted to get in touch with me, you had three and only three options. There might be another one. You can help me. You would call the phone that was bolted to my kitchen wall. Yeah. You'd do that. You could come to my house and see if I were there. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you'd go up the shops and see if you could find me. Right. <laughs> maybe write me a letter. You could write me a letter. There's four ways. Okay. <laughs> So I understand that people were distracted in the 80s and could, could plunge themselves headlong into VHS tapes and crossword puzzles and things sure. like that. But today, how many ways can people get a hold of us? Instagram direct message, Twitter direct message, email, text message, Facebook. It's, I don't think we're meant to live like this. I mm -hmm. don't want to live in a continual state of, I need to be reacting, responding. Mm -hmm. And it's like one of these things and everyone knows that experience where it's like, okay, I didn't hear my phone ding, but I should check and see if I've got an email. So I'm just getting to the point where I'm happy to let people be offended rather than have to keep my phone on me because yeah. people text you like they're in the same room as you. Yeah. How you doing? I saw that you read it. Why aren't you saying I'm good? Thanks. Yeah. I don't want to live that kind of life. Yeah. I'd rather you be offended that I didn't get back to you. I yeah. can't. I can't do yeah. this. Yeah. And I think part of it is I actually have, I think, a much shorter fuse for that stuff than most people i think there are people who are just very good at dealing with a lot of plates spinning at once mm -hmm. maybe not as good as i think they are but i think my wife for example is really good at that yeah. whereas I, it's I, it's like i um i get overwhelmed quickly yeah it's that that experience when you walk into a mall when we used to have malls and there's just so much going on that you kind of feel something happening in your yeah. brain yeah it's like that yeah I just uh yeah anyway yeah yeah i i think um and to be honest, like I typically the way we speak or the preach and thing like isn't super like harsh or like condemning, but I think we have a problem with the smartphone. Amen. Preach I, now. I really do. Um, and we see it as we, we, we work with like young men in particular who are like, who are discerning, who are reaching out and just what people, or even just like college students, what people are struggling with now, as opposed to what they were struggling with 15 years, it's different. It really is different, and th and it's, and I it, in my mind like what is and and d by different I don't just mean like a different category but deeper and worse, um, and in my just obviously like what is the novelty? What's the big change that's happened since I entered? I entered two thousand nine. It really is this sort of the, the smartphone, and and the anxiety it causes obviously like with pornography and and the effects of that, um, but also there's just. And this is my primary concern. There's always something easier and more interesting to do than pray. And um, and we have a problem of people who aren't praying. And I think a primary agent in that in causing that problem is just the first thing they pick up in the morning, the last thing they they touch at night. It's the smartphone. And people just like we have a crisis. Of, my my primary I think judgment at this point hypothesis like our primary crisis right now in the church in the world is is a crisis of prayer. And the smartphone, it just makes it so hard to have any real prayer life. I remember thinking to myself before the time of the smartphone, imagine if there was a machine that you could step into and go anywhere you wanted. I was living in Canada at the time and I really missed my family. I thought, wouldn't that be cool? I'd go home for a bit, you know, on yeah. a Sunday afternoon, hang out with mom and dad, come back to Canada, yeah. maybe go over to Japan, hang yeah. out there, see what they've got going on. And it didn't take me long as I thought about this to realize how terrible that would be because mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine myself being happy anywhere because yeah. I could like right now literally go to Tibet, uh, you know, and that's essentially what we have in the smartphone. It's yeah. like nothing can be yeah. interesting enough. We're, yeah. we're so addicted to novelty. So yeah. I, I would like to see more fire and brimstone yeah. as it pertains to, yeah. to phones. And, and I would really like to encourage people to take their phone right now and to break it on the corner of their table, <laughs> yeah. stop. I get how ironic it is because uh -huh. I make money through doing this, but yeah. like break it and stop watching Pints with Aquinas. Yeah. And thank God that you're free. And I also get this, like maybe, you know, it's, people could watch this, easy for you to say, right? Like you're, you're, you don't have a job except your YouTube thing. And this guy's a fryer. Like I actually have a job, I need it. And that's yeah. fine. But like, don't let yourself off the hook too lightly. Yeah. Like 
hopefully you're taking weekends off. Why do you need a phone? Why do people need to write to you? Like, to hell with those people. You've got a family in front yeah. of you. They need you. Yeah. They don't need you. Yeah. Um, break your television. Set it on fire. And then <laughs> film it with your phone. Live stream the burning of your television. Then break your phone. Oh. <laughs> Not even joking. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't... I think we... As you said earlier, like, it's a hack. I don't know how you... How did you put that? I call it... I think I said it will will hack or something like that willpower hack. It's, like, it's like we're beyond the point of being able to maintain our self-control yeah. in the face of these devices yeah. so just just yeah. break it and love your family yeah i'm gonna I'll tell, I'll t- says says a hypocrite who isn't about to do that I'm, I'm gonna tell a story on that but but that was part of our own observation with us like franciscan friars of the renewal like are pretty like we've lived a pretty intense formative life for a long time um we're men of prayer we're men of sincerity we're men of pretty strong will but still if you put if you put the internet in our houses it's gonna it, how quickly we become sort of dependent on it. It's gonna depend on the, the individual, but with enough time and enough sort of just being around it, it it just sucks you in. It's just geared for it, and we all have the same humanity, mm-hmm. you know. And it's just, um, yeah. Yeah. People sometimes say, imagine how much more Aquinas could have been able to do if he had access to the Bible in the way we have on the internet. No, he would have yeah. been an idiot like you yeah. and me. He wouldn't yeah. have been writing five million yeah. books and becoming yeah. a saint. And that's, that's again, that's a similar, that's kind of, I think that's the temptation for us. It's like, to, it's at the service of, it's always going to be in the name of apostolate. It yeah. can always be the name so of mission. Dangerous. But it, if you do that in a certain period of time, the qual, like the quality of the man, the quality of the friar is going to go down. And what we might be, we're going to be doing more, but it's going to be less effective. Amen. 100%. But but in a, a work of God, this, this book right here, there's some, there's pictures, but there's also an article, like a number of articles based off of like the pillars of our life. And one of them is the story of a man down in Texas mm-hmm. where he's, he's, um, he's just realizing he's like in a men's group and he's realizing he's like not being present to his family. He's not praying the way he wants to because he's watching TV. And so he's down in Texas and he goes to like this young adult. There's uh, it's, he's a, he's probably in his forties. He goes to this men's group and one of the guys say, you got a shotgun? He says, yeah. So, uh, take your, take your, take it and shoot your TV. Mm. And so he, like whatever it was, like a week later, he comes to the friary with a picture of him standing on his TV and it's got a big hole in it, <laughs> and he shot his TV. You know, it's basically what you were saying. And yeah. and like, uh, if whatever, if something's causing you to sin, pluck it out, cut it off. Like there is, but but see what the the thing is with the phone is it is both the cure, in a sense, in a limited sense, and the source of our anxiety. Like you get into an elevator and you get, you're not going to stand there like an idiot looking at the friggin' door for three floors where you got some stranger next to you. You pull out your phone. Mm-hmm. You go stand in line at the coffee shop. There's no one to talk to. You feel awkward. I mean, mm-hmm. you don't because you don't have one, but you pull out your phone. So in a way, it cures your anxiety. I want to listen to some like lo-fi hip hop. I want to just you know just chill a bit. No, I want to relax. I want to. Li- so it, in a sense, in a in a in a kind of. Um, uh, superficial sense it does it does if it didn't you wouldn't pull it out when you felt awkward or anxious mm-hmm. so of course it's do, but then it then the anxiety goes all the deeper yeah so what so i actually take the uh, month of august off of the internet every year i started doing it three years ago oh, excellent. So august 1st august yeah. whatever the end is 30 days has september i don't know but i, I actually um have my wife change the password on my phone on my computer and then I have like a, a message that says, you know, write to my assistant, maybe if you want to, whatever, get a hold of me. But otherwise, <laughs> and then I just go off the grid and it's the greatest. But for the first like week, it's brutal. Yeah. It's brutal. Yeah. But my point was just to say, okay, I get that I'm, I'm blessed that I can do that because I can record a ton of episodes, work my tail off in July. So then set them to go off in August, right? So I get that I'm, most people probably couldn't do that given their job, but you can do something mm-hmm. and don't let yourself off the hook too quickly. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And, I, and things as little as having a desktop computer, as opposed to like doing all your internet work off of like having, having like a, if you will, like a dumb phone and like a laptop or a computer, just like little, little things like that can make a difference. You just need, it's, it really is. It's like when everything is so small and in your hand and fits in your pocket and goes everywhere you go because it's not you're never just it's never just your lo-fi hip-hop machine if you want that like go back get it there's probably a cd somewhere yeah (laughs) you know what i mean like pull out the the walkman um you know have like a vibe you know (laughs) yeah um be cool about it at least yeah but i do think i love that that's a great example of like 
you just it, they, they, there need to be some boundaries and some intentionality and some and un- more than you think there needs to be Probably, yeah. because you're more pathetic than you think you are yeah most of us are all of us are yeah. like we're both more pathetic and more beautiful than we think we are but, right yeah but this idea that no i, I got it I, no, I can i can no you shut up you can't so just do you need to do something at some point you do just need to say that yeah no like stop stop and, and it's <sighs> just it's just because it's not because you're weak or because whatever again like that is as big of a problem for the religious who've been living it for 40 years who's yeah. been who has you know what i mean like it's so true I mean, we just, all see our grandparents are addicted to these things it's yeah. not like you have to grow <laughs> yeah. up with it in order for it to be addictive yeah we all have grandparents who are yeah. always on the ipad because yeah. it's yeah. It's, uh, it's it's designed to be that way the, what what comes to mind is um the whole like selling like of a birthright for lentils was that like jacob no, and isaac yeah uh esau oh, esau that's right isaac and esau jacob and I, esau jacob and esau yeah I know what the Bible is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, Let's text Father Pine. This guy, right? Father Pine. That's we on our podcast. We say that a lot. Well, I can't think of the word. Father Pine would know. Yeah. Um, listen to whatever it is. Uh, God's planning. Um, but we just we too quickly surrender our inheritance Gosh. and what we're really made for for lentils for a little bit more information for a little bit of lo-fi hip hop for whatever it is and it's just like you're right, man. And if you look if you look at the scriptures and you're like, oh, this guy sold it for his birthright for these lentils yeah, what, what an idiot, what an idiot. you like, literally do you it are an every idiot day too. all the time all the time and but the hard part a hard part is people don't really care or listen like if you do like we do a sense presents and you do like a video on like putting down your phone it does very poorly compared to a lot of other topics mm. it's just we kind of know it but we it's really hard to make that step to actually god man it, there's it's subtle enough that like we kind of know it's a problem but we kind of again it satiates us a yeah. bit it's yeah. like uh, yeah and it can certainly there there can be levels of it that that are good but i just do they're think, not worth talking about at this point yeah <laughs> you know like saint paul wouldn't have been on twitter stop saying he would have maybe he would have. what do i know uh-huh. but you know at some point uh, forget the nuance and just say kill it i, I was listening to matt walsh a friend of mine Three years ago, he did a podcast on what social media is doing to us. I was so inspired by it that I literally got off three years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I still have it because I'm a hypocrite um, and I need to push my wares. So, but I gave, I pay someone to run it now. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I, three years ago when I did this, I said, change the passwords, don't tell me what they are. I mean, he could have ruined my life, but it was so wonderful. Yeah. And then I, I came back because I changed guys. So I came back on for like a few weeks and I'm like, this is a flaming dumpster heap. I mm-hmm. cannot believe we're doing this. And mm-hmm. yeah. The other thing I wanted to say is, and, and people I think notice this when they go to other countries. I know Western countries are kind of similar, but y'all, we, me, are frantic. We are not living at a human tempo. Yeah, I remember moving to America and being like, why do y'all have like, the mail delivered on Saturday. That's depressing. Why did my employer say, what day do you want to take as your day off? Mm-hmm. Why did he say that? That's that's kind of sad. And yeah. you know, even today, like people are like, hey, I was wondering if you're probably really busy. And I'm like, I'm not busy. I just don't want to do your thing. Because mm-hmm. if I do your thing, I can't lay on my couch. Mm-hmm. And I want to lay on my couch. <laughs> I can't wrestle my son on the bed. That can't come naturally if yeah. I have to schedule myself to kingdom come. Yeah. So no, I don't want to do your thing, and it's not because I'm busy. I don't, I'm not. I'm a jerk, but but I say that because I, I do think there's truth that we all kind of experience that. It's like, well, I would like some time to just be at peace and have a coffee, and yeah, yeah. and I don't need to make an excuse for why yeah. I'm going to do nothing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah, boundaries and rest and all that are yeah. And this is the difference with right leisure and dissociative activities, sure. right? Yep. And that's what we're talking about. Like I've had the experience. I got the laptop cracked open on my chest, watching a show, and then I go to another window and I'm scrolling through social media. Oh, this has been a long time since I've done this, but I'm no longer watching it. I'm listening to it, scrolling, and someone sent me a text. Like, what the hell am I doing? This yeah. is not. I'm distracting myself from the yeah. chaos that is me and I, that I don't want to face right now. Yeah, and that's not leisurely. That's yeah. not like rest takes effort doesn't it mm-hmm. like this thing i'm about to do for these next three nights without my phone that takes strength i don't yeah. i don't want to do it i'd yeah. rather just yeah i'd rather you be like hey there's this new netflix show you got to watch okay sweet i'll go binge yeah. that yeah i'll go watch breaking bad for the next three days straight again or something like but rest man that takes that takes hard work mm-hmm. yeah we i had a brother use the term the other day of like the discipline of rest and it spoke to me because i'm not good at it i'm not good at it at all um, but it's just, it, it is a curious thing. Like the Lord gave us, um, like a command 
to keep the Sabbath, for example. Like, like basically, he said, like, yeah, like, why would you have to do that if it came natural? Right. And it's funny. It's like, we're so bad at it. And so, like, what's, why? Because we're all tired. And we all want to just, we all, in a sense, want rest. But somehow, a lot of us still struggle, for example, with the Sunday, like keeping Sunday holy and kind of having it be a day that's unique. It's like, why, why is that? And I think there is, there's a discipline. There's a, there's a, there's a discipline to rest and to, there's, it is a work of like, of, um, it, it is, it is, there's a sacrifice to like not using this day to do more work, to get caught up. There's, there, there is a sacrifice to, um, the rest, which is, um, n- not just turning on and checking out like YouTube or whatever, but just like actually not being plugged in and, mm-hmm. and being present to your family, things like that. It is, it's a, it's a fascinating thing that we're just not good at it. And I think it, I think it's because there's always a, authentic rest. There's a sacrificial nature to authentic rest. And, um. But it's a command, right? So like working on Sundays and doing the grind doesn't make you like tough. It just makes you disobedient. And and I think I think there's, uh, mm. wow, if we could take back the Sabbath, that would be, that would do wonders. What do you do for leisure time? Myself. What, is, what does a friar do for leisure? So um, it's going to depend on the friar. It's going to depend on the friar and it's going to depend on the house. I live with 20 guys. Wow. So there, and, there, and um, 10 of them are the new men called postulants. And so there's there's a lot of youth, there's a lot of life, there's a lot of like there's a lot also a lot of free time for them. So there's always things going on. Um, I'm 36, which is starting to trend more towards the phase where what I like to do is just like sit with some of the bros and talk. And yeah, like, so that's kind of what I like to do. Playing basketball has always been something that I, I've been involved with as well. Uh, I like to take naps and I like to read, um, but but. A lot of guys are like playing board games and um, yeah, it's kind of like, there's kind of like these different schools, there's like the board game guys, there's the sit and chat guys, there's the flip through magazine guys. Um, we played ping pong the other day for the first nice. time in a while. So it, but, but the idea is that it's something, and and I think this is actually what, one of the things I'm proudest of the brothers. We do really well. It's like, whatever we're doing, it just, you got to do it with some guys. Like you got to do it together. Um, it, it can't because you have your time for contemplation and reading built into your <clears throat> schedule I would assume yeah so it's yeah. about four or five hours a day yeah right so you've got that fixed now it's time to be brotherhood yeah exactly and so when we're talking about so our, our typical like in a monastery or something like that they might have like recreation where it's like okay we're gonna go sit in a room and hang out for us that's dinner and so every evening from five from six to seven so we have holy hour together five to six six to seven it's family dinner, essentially one of the brothers cooks, you're there, you eat together and you're there for the whole hour. Mm. And that's part of the time where you like, you chat, you catch up, you spend time together. And that's, um, yeah, that's really important. It's really formative. I remember living in, not living. I went and visited the friars in London. Yeah. Uh, and I remember just the joy. There's nothing quite like the joy of a friars, Franciscan friars renewal's household. It was just beautiful. Yeah. I remember it was like we, it was like a feast day, so they brought out the beer. And it wasn't refrigerated, but I didn't care. <laughs> it was just so fun. Yeah, and that's yeah. There's something beautiful about that. I'm like I'm trying to be renewed in that. I think because I'm in like admin oh, work man, land. Yeah, you know, and so like one of the parts of the carefree Franciscan thing is like a lot someone's of, gonna take care yeah, of yeah so like they just don't have to care about anything <laughs> yeah and it's like my job to care about things i forget who it was who was an associate of gandhi's who said if gandhi knew how much it took to keep him poor something exactly. similar there. yeah exactly exactly and so it's like because we still have a budget and we still have finances and we still have paperwork and yeah. we have you know someone's looking at a spreadsheet somewhere yeah exactly and so i'm like that guy uh, you know or i'm one of those guys um but so like because i'm yeah i'm definitely in like responsibility land and so one of the one of the costs of that is just like I I like I kind of referred to is like I do have the to do list which never leaves me alone you know mm. um, but I think one of the gifts of being I was, do you know what honorings are uh, the, maybe the concept yeah so like we did it on net I think when I yeah, started as a missionary I think it was like a charismatic thing and I think that's where it kind of like became part of like some Catholic circles as so basically for us like on um, we celebrate what we call feast days. And so a typical tradition in a Franciscan friar friary is that like when it's a brother's feast day, everybody honors them. And so it's like at the end of dinner and you all kind of just say something encouraging about the guy. But, um, it's been, it's one of the most convicting things 
for me to sit around and see and hear some of the brothers being honored who are getting honored for their joyfulness, who are getting honored for their lightheartedness, for their presence. Cause it's just like, it's, it's this like really beautiful indirect way to, to remind me like, I'm really bad at that. And I'm really uh. bad at that. And I'm really bad at that. And I need to get better. Um, and so I'm, yeah, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on the journey of, uh, for about five years kind of been in work admin land and now trying to like make sure I don't, I don't lose the Franciscan joy and peace and mm. lightheartedness, which is, I think, um, I wonder if that comes with age too, a sort of creeping cynicism Yeah, that uh, may be independent of these other things. Yeah. That are, yeah. I hope not. I, I hope mean, not too. I mean, I mean you, at least I, mean, I hope there that are people who walk with the Lord and they, they've learned how to yeah. not take themselves yeah. too seriously yeah. or even current events too seriously. Yeah. Just, our, um, we haven't, his, we call our, our boss, our leader, our general servant. Mm. And we have an incredible general servant. His name's Father John Paul, who is a um, an incredible, because like, no one's busier than him. No one has more responsibility than yeah. him. But he's incredible at just navigating it well and with peace and with boundaries and with personal time and with still mm. being present to people. And so I I have a huge gift of being able to sort of learn from him and um and try and apply that going forward. Do you know he was in London when I went and visited the friars? I didn't know that, no. And I remember going for a walk with him and he was like, so tell me why you want to be a friar, you know? And I gave him some reasons that yeah. I thought were pretty well articulated. And he went, nah, I don't think you're being, I don't think you're being called to be a friar. <laughs> <laughs> everything, and it was lovely. Yeah. I don't, I'm not, but I'm, everything I would say, you know, oh, just like, you know, this and that. It's like, yeah, well, it's way tougher than it looks and it's not as romantic as you think yeah. it is. And, but I actually really appreciated that because when I was in Australia, it felt like, I mean, for, forgive me if this sounds disrespectful, but there, were, there seemed to be several dying religious orders that were begging me to join them. Yeah. It was really cool to, to, yeah. to approach a community that's like, yeah, maybe we don't want you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And that's still, that says something to men. And I think we're getting better at it because we almost used to like pride ourselves on like, like if you like my class and around there, there's so many of us, like our first time of trying to contact the friars, like they didn't call us back or they yeah. didn't write us back or things like that. And uh, I mean, you can pretend that's intentional yeah, now, right? Like yeah. it was part of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, we're it wasn't. We, just didn't we don't. Yeah. We don't need you. You know, whatever. <laughs> but it was just poor admin probably. Um, so we're getting better at that. But there is something that speaks. Uh, I mean, that was part of my own vocation, to be honest. Is like when I, I called somebody. And they were like, okay, we'll sign you up and we'll send you the paperwork. And it was just, it was in one conversation. Yeah, 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 and I was yeah. like, I, this is, there's something off here. It'd be like seeing a girl asking if she wants to go on a date. And she's like, yeah, totally. And our yeah. first child's name will be Henry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, but we're not, and I think we're not alone in this. I think uh, there's a, a mm -hmm. number of communities who are like this. Is Well, because you're only causing pain for yourself later on. If you yeah. get a guy who's messed up or. Exactly. Exactly. Is, is, uh, who, we're especially we're, messed up. We're gonna have say. to. We're, we're gonna have up, to. We're gonna have to live with these people. Yeah, we might want to be discerning. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's and it's not just that. It's like we do want the good of the person as well. Of and, course. And yeah. after enough experience, you can you can get some indication of what will work or what won't work. But but um, it sounds like for you, it wasn't like earth shattering when he said eh, no, maybe I not. Because mean, maybe I'm making it sound maybe I'm making him sound more abrasive than he was. Mm -hmm. He wasn't abrasive. He was very, but I, it was just shocking to me, the contrast of people saying, please join us and him being yeah. like, I don't know if you're called to this. I mean, just yeah. because you feel this doesn't mean. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but that is, that is when somebody sincerely desires to be a, a, a brother or a seminarian or a nun, and they're not given permission to enter. That is really difficult. Yeah. That can be, that can be really difficult. Um, cause it's, it's, it's really hard not to feel rejected by the church and yeah, by like, God. what's wrong with me? Right. What is wrong with yeah. me that you won't have me? Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that is something I've, I've never, I'm not the vocation director, so I've never had to have that conversation, but I have received people on the back end who whatever wanted to be join some convent and they said no. And it's just like, it's, it's a really hard thing to receive. Um, but but these people are, are are at the end of the day it is understanding you and your good and, and just what works it's it is it's really hard mm. yeah and, but it's and that's the same thing too is like it's just um it's better to sort of 
let you like to make this discernment now as opposed to like invite you to live this life for 10 years and then yeah. you just kind of fall apart and yeah so that's that's hard what's uh some of the more crazy working in the bronx stories that you got for us what was because you're from the california yeah you, you i guess you do a lot of formation in some rougher parts of new york mm-hmm. what were some things that you saw and you were like whoa not in kansas anymore yeah the, f- the first really crazy thing that stood out was um it was actually the night before investiture which is when you receive the habit and uh that must be such a cool day it's a very cool day <laughs> it's a very cool day it's a it's a powerful day um looking yeah we can get to that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. okay um but we went my classmates and i like with our superior like we went sledding the night before <gasps> the day before it was the afternoon i guess and one of the brothers sprained his wrist and we so we spent we had to go to the er and basically we were in the emergency room until i don't know it was probably two in the morning something like that and i remember so we took the train back from the hospital to where we were in the bronx at the time and first of all i just remember being in like the subway at that time and you could just hear like the rats everywhere and they because they're like (laughs) when there's not as much traffic or whatever they're just like running all over the subway and you can hear outside so this was in this was in the subway, but like on the track. Oh, I see. So you're like you know at the elevated kind of stand, and the, but down below is like the track, oh, and it was like it was really gross, and it was kind of like horror movie ish. It was just like eerie, um, and then walking back, and like the city was alive, uh, but I just remember like it was not alive in a good way, you know, and just seeing somebody with like they'd gotten in a fight, and like their whole face was all bloody, and they were just like. And and that was that was just this ex- experience of like, because Har- especially now, but even then, Harlem during the day, it was pretty quiet. You know, there's like some people on the corner who are doing things they shouldn't be doing, but at night there's this whole like dark side that came out, and that was pretty shocking to me. I didn't know, I didn't know that was a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that was, that's the first one that comes comes to mind. Um, any, you want some more? Or you want was that? Let's do it. Yeah, because I'm, I'm trying to think of. At a certain point, um, it just becomes, it becomes day nor- to day. Yeah, you know what I mean. And yeah, so it, is, it is. It is interesting. Um, what about just the noise of the city? How is that adjusting to that? Not only are you sleeping it, on a floor, but yeah. you got to sleep on a floor listening it, to. It depends on the guy. It depends on the guy. For me, it was always, and that's part of it. It just was always kind of like interesting to me. There's there was just something novel, and it kind of it probably in a prideful way. It kind of felt like romantic or felt cool, yeah. like when you're in the chapel, and then there's like sirens and people sirens swearing and, and rap and yeah, all that. It's like yeah, I'm in it, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. But for a lot of the guys, particularly if you're from like the Midwest or you're from kind of small town, um, it is like terrible. For a lot of guys moving to New York and the noise and all that I is bet. like the worst thing ever. It's a real it's a real obstacle and a real trial. Um, we kind of get ahead of it in like our constitutions again, which is just that reminder that uh, we understand that part of our sacrifice of our life and the penance of our life is just living in this environment, which in a lot of ways is kind of not healthy. Now you said you've been a CFR at heart from the beginning, but was there an adjustment to working with the poor for you? That was one of the, that was, um, you kind of, we use the word charisms and, and charism can sort of have a couple, we use it in different ways in the church. So, so it can be like a corporate charism, like, like a community can have a charism, the order can have a charism, but individuals can as well. And, um, for myself, and it's kind of like a special anointed, special gift of the spirit, which has a particular ease and fruitfulness. And I have charisms, both of poverty and of, and of basically mission being a missionary. So I kind of thrive outside Mm. of my natural context and so, um, like when I was 20, as I kind of allude to very briefly, myself and a buddy, we went and taught in like this rural Zulu African, South African school. And um, I was there from 20 to 21. And it's like, it's wild, but I loved everything about it. And uh, after college, like I, I spent a couple of weeks living at and working with the homeless shelter. I've been to, did mission work in Honduras a couple of times in Mexico. And so for me, um, I'd already kind of been doing it. Um, it is different. Yeah, it's different. Um, it's different when you're doing a trip and something like that than when, for example, like at the shelter, 
like we were for like initial COVID times, we were like quarantined with the, the homeless men for like a hundred days. It's different when you have to share your life with these people and you have to like, and they can get annoying. You know, like it's what not always romantic. What do you mean quarantine with the homeless man? What does that look like? So, um, so COVID. Yeah. COVID happened. Yeah, where are that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, New York. Yeah. Um, things were pretty strict. And so at one point, and this is totally like a sign of the times of like where we were. We thought it was going to be two weeks, but we basically told the guys. That's like, what we were told, weren't we? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that, but, but, um, because normally uh, it's St. Anthony Shelter in the Bronx. Normally it's what would be considered like maybe a night shelter. The guys come in the evening, they have dinner with us, they stay the night, they leave in the morning. And so it's just kind of discerned that you can't, you, like, we can't be doing this. You, if you're going to, we all have to kind of, if you want to stay here, you can stay here. If you want to leave, you can leave. But we can't do this whole like back and forth thing uh, because we're living together. We're sharing our lives together. And so if, yes, whatever. Um, yeah. It also, we had no idea what it was. Exactly. People were exactly. rightly, you know. Exactly. And so that was, it, this was like right at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And we, so we were like, okay, we're going to just, if you want to stay, if you want to leave, you can leave. If you want to stay, you have to stay for two weeks. So how many men were there with you? It started about 30. 30 homeless men? Yeah. So 30. Um, I was in the Bronx, in the Bronx, we have two friaries and one of them runs the shelter. One of them typically runs like a youth center and does some other things. The youth center was, had to shut down. And so, so we all kind of like, it was all hands on deck at the shelter. And it's one of the most unbelievable, beautiful experiences. And it was a gift. Um, cause like in some friaries or some people like, I'll just use the friaries. Like you were just kind of like locked in and you couldn't leave and you didn't really have anything to do. You know, and so they did like a lot of maintenance projects and prayed and stuff. But so I'm grateful that we had still, if you will, like a mission. It meant that things were heightened up instead of two meals a day. We were doing six meals a day. We had to have like a, a quarantine. Um, and did you have, uh, were there certain guys that caused a, enough trouble that you had to ask them to leave? You can't. That was one of the laws. Because they had nowhere to go. Is well, that... and, but there was like a law made that in this time, like you can't evict somebody. Oh, wow. And so we did have... We did have, unless they're causing um, like physical danger, you like, unless they're attacking somebody, you Were there can't. some people that you wish would begin to cause physical danger so you could Ca ask yeah, them to Yeah, basically, <laughs> basically. Yeah, so man, did, it's I, gonna be I, hard. I mean, living yeah. with your own family for that long yeah. can be difficult. Living yeah. with 30 men who are different but, backgrounds and yeah. different habits. And, and, and we just had, yeah, one of the men in particular who just, it was fa like, at first he like, he was super great and then he just caused a lot of struggles and there was a lot of drama and, mm -hmm. And it's and it's the hard part is it's not just like if it was just like him to us, we can handle it. But it's him to everybody, and so it's just like a thing. And you're all quarantined together, and it's Golly. pretty tight quarters. And um, but it was really, it was really beautiful. Um, and this is a phenomenal thing. And this is a, a I think a great witness to divine providence is um, one of the men at the shelter. Uh, so he, this guy. Um, one of the men at the shelter, he's a volunteer now, kind of a long-standing volunteer. He came in uh, basically off the street. He came in as a homeless man who needed help. And and in his time with us, he came back to the faith. He used to run a, a catering business. And um, it's really it's really beautiful that he just has this deep loyalty to the shelter and to us. And so he lives on one of the floors now. And, so he's, right. and he like, he's like part of the team. But he, he basically... For he basically ran our kitchen because again it was six meals a day, because of um, basically two breakfasts, two lunches, two dinners, and so we we had this man who used to be homeless who now been living with us for a couple of years who could just handle the whole kitchen, for and he had like a hundred days without a day off basically, and so you just kind of see the beauty of divine providence that this man who kind of came in in a place of need um, came back to the faith and ended up being a huge gift to us during this time of. Of corn, because if we didn't have him, it would have been really hard for us to to run that thing. Goodness gracious! Yeah, wow, how crazy! Yeah, what's it like when uh, you or other friars go home dressed like you are? Because I mean, in New York, people dress like all sorts of ways, yeah. so you probably don't look yeah. that much different. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and they're but. more likely in New York to like not be awkward and just say something. Yes. You know what I mean? Which is kind of nice. It and sometimes is, yeah. it's, it's really wild and funny. Um, yeah. So I do appreciate that more than just kind of like the stares. Um, really, yeah. Like if you're with a friar in like a distinguished place, like where you want to be is like 10 feet behind them. Because that's when people like they think like the friars pass. And so they do like the full look. Ah. That's when you get like the little conversations, the little reactions. 
because so I don't necessarily see that because it's not always like right in front of you. Yeah, you just have, no people are staring. Um, the fr- it's a little bit uncomfortable because you're from a you say an affluent area. Yeah. Do you go back to that area? Exactly. Yeah. What's that like? Yeah, it's a little bit. I and that's a funny thing is you get used to it and there's a value to it. I don't really love being the center of attention. Like I don't love. Well, especially in the sense that people think you're awkward. Yeah. When that's the attention they're giving exactly. you, I can see why any nobody would like that. Exactly. And so unless I, it was penitential. One hundred percent. And so I don't love. I don't love that. So I don't like. I don't love. Do like, your parents uh, find it weird? Like, do they not enjoy you walking around? I don't know. I'm just thinking. If I was yeah. a fryer, I go back to Port Pirie, South Australia. We go up the sh- shop for some fish and chips. I could see my parents being like, ah, "Okay, I'm not going to tell him that we find this awkward being yeah. with him as well." But yeah. Like, they haven't my... they haven't said either way yeah yeah because i do kind of like feel bad i don't that's one of the things probably like i don't want i'm sure if like people are looking at your son weird like that's not your yeah. favorite feeling <laughs> you know what i mean like so I, I feel bad a little bit i hope that's not the case i think they just yeah. kind of at this point are no i'm are sure okay they were with it. used to it yeah one of the funny ones is the the for me the most awkward are answering the door at my parents house or bathroom situations because all of a sudden like for example like i'm like washing my hands in the bathroom and somebody comes out of the stall we're about to be very like close and sort of intimate and this is not what you're expecting and i'm always like i know this is gonna be uncomfortable for you i'm really sorry in advance um just like like that tight quarters or because my parents it's a nice house in like a nice neighborhood and you go up big doors you open the door and it's like me and it's just like not you know i mean it's like it's just not what they're yeah. expecting. Um, we had, I had some friends over at one point. We had like some pizza. Uh, and uh, so I answered the door and like helped bring the pizza in. And the girl was like, so are you like having like a dress up party or something? And I was like, no, no. I just kind of like, no, no, that's not what we're doing. Um, but people just don't. N- no, I mean, it's fair enough. If you're yeah. gonna dr- you are dressed weird. Like 100%. you should expect people yeah. to do that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. it could get annoying. This happens to you all the time. I can see, but it's not their fault. It's your fault for looking like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, and really. I don't have, a, and that's the, th- is it's, it's, that kind of stuff is fun or funny. Yeah. You know what I mean? But there is like if... Uh, I hear Benedict Grishel said the only place he was kind of abused was in Ireland. Someone spat on him walking down the street. Interesting. I haven't heard that, but... I didn't hear that firsthand. Yeah, so. yeah. I don't... The only time I've really had very negative things is when we do like we pray outside of abortion clinics. That would be that would be a hard one um, because people kind of know what you're about. I, I was speaking to one of your friars. Actually, yeah. you've done... You've done some... Uh, Ascension Presents videos with him. Black hair. He just did a video on Ascension, I think, about making rosaries. Father like, Malachi. Yeah, Father yeah, yeah. Malachi Georgia. and He's I. Georgia. Hey, what is he? Yeah, yeah. He probably told me that. I forgot. But him and I were having a beer together after one talk I gave in Manhattan. And he said, stop me if you've heard this, mm-hmm. but depending on where he is in the country, he explains what he is differently. Yeah. So if he's on the West Coast, he's like, yeah, minimalism, living simply, like, awesome, you know? Yeah. You live in the South, it's about Jesus, trying to live like Jesus. Amen. You, you yeah. know, Northeast, serving the poor. And that those answers usually yeah. are quite ex- yeah. know, accepted there. Yeah, you definitely, yeah, that's that's totally a true thing. You kind of adjust your explanation of what you are depending <laughs> depending on the audience. That's 100% true. Um, we Yeah. How bad does a habit have to get before someone's like, dude, you need to replace it? Because you all patch your habits and things like that, yeah. which is sweet. I love it. The answer is going to be different for the brother. A new habit is, for me, new habit is like the worst. Yeah, a new habit would be embarrassing. I don't it's want like, that. And it's it's all like, it's very You're stiff. not seasoned. Yeah. So this one. <laughs> it's a I'm mark of shame to wear a new habit, I would imagine. I'm going I'm going to be going to a wedding after this, after, so before I go back to the friary. Because so, okay. the, the, my normal, typical habit is like all patched up and it has a huge hole in the back right now, which is like, do you know what gr- Gorilla Tape is? Yes. Gorilla Tape is like the, my favorite thing in the world. It's basically Gorilla Tape What's the tape difference together. between Gorilla Tape and Duct Tape? Uh, I think Gorilla Tape is just more intense. Okay. I think it's just- More intense than Duct Tape. I think so. It's like you've gone from duck to a gorilla. Like yeah. what's the next step? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Godzilla tape. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so, cause you, yeah, and it kind of gets like, it has like a story and it's kind of been with you a long time yeah. and it's kind of like, just like you're at, yeah. Yeah. So for me, I haven't actually gotten a new habit since I so got cool. my first habit, basically. That's really cool. Is there ever an instance where you need to wear just normal clothes or that you do? No. Never, like playing That's basketball. So cool. Playing basketball or painting a house, Gosh, something it, like that. It seems to me that like the it's it's nice to see people returning to their traditions. I remember I went and stayed with the Capuchins in Melbourne. I was discerning them and very good men there. And but at the time, like a lot of them wouldn't wear the habit, you know. And so you mm-hmm. just get this like middle aged duo 
door or middle-aged guy opening the door and you're like i don't want to become a bachelor yeah. Like I, yeah but i think that's changing yeah yeah and i th- i think we kind of talked about some like the you know you're sometimes people look at you funny but i just i do value wearing the habit very highly i mean i know i've been in airports and i get a little frustrated or impatient with somebody but if i were dressed like that i i wouldn't be able to or i'd yeah. be more aware sure. that, of me getting impatient. yeah 100 percent. so it's 100%. almost like accountability too and just typically again like there's the the negative experiences are very small yeah. people looking at you funny is very common but you get over that you know like you said i I'm like, you I'm not surprised by that. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that at all. Um, but the typical, the general experiences and encounters are, are very positive. I would almost think that in today's day and age, wearing a collar would be more scary than wearing that, mm-hmm. right? Because a collar, people are like, oh, priest, child abuser, which is yeah. crappy, but that's where we are. Whereas if you're dressed like that, you're like, monk, Tibet, yeah. something different. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I do think that's true. Mm. I do think that's true. Um, I wouldn't have believed you if you had have said I'd mentioned Tibet twice in this episode, but there it is. I just we, said it again three times. Three times. It's New amazing. record. We'll see how we yeah. get that again. Um, yeah. Well, I did recently have somebody ask us where our temple was, thinking that we were Buddhist monks. They saw us walking around. But um, yeah, just I guess to kind of bring the, the final point, it's like I... I would, I would, if someone tried to take my hat away or say like we weren't going to wear, it, I would, I would fight for. Like Good. I do value it and I love everything about it and, and I, I do wear it. You know, um, yeah, it, it's a gift and it's and it's 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 good to be reminded of who you are in such a tangible way as well. Uh, so I do, I love, I love, I love that habit. So tell us about your investor, what that is, what that looks like, uh, when mm-hmm. it happens. Okay. In in the life of a postulant or sure. novice, whatever. Yeah. So so when I first entered postulancy is what it's called is like the first phase and you you're kind of super awkward at that time you they give you like a you start growing out the beard shaved head but you have like a white kind of like long sleeve polo shirt across uh sandals and then like gray pants and no one really knows what you are that's just like a very nice like sort of the teenage phase of of (laughs) of friarhood you're just very awkward and then so it used to be six months now it's 10 months and then that's when you it's called investiture which is when you receive the habit you receive your religious name um and you enter into technically that's when you're formally a part of the community technically as a postulant you're not part of the community yet the order um so you become a formal part of the order and you enter into to novitiate and that for us happens um this year will be like july 21st so it's about 10 plus months after you've joined why did they move it from six to ten months uh the world's different now we just need more time yeah yeah guys just need more time and um and even even most men before they enter postulancy are going to be doing a year or two of some sort of service formation like focus like net like working at our homeless shelter uh it's just the the consequences of the fallen like it's a fallen culture and a fallen world and the consequences of that are real Mm. and so the journey from the world to religious life it's a little bit it's it's it takes a little bit more time Mm. and that's that's just the reality what was it like for you being invested is that the word in the investiture invest y- yeah yeah um you just to be honest like it is a big deal but you probably think it's a lot bigger deal than it is <laughs> you know what i mean like for me it was like the biggest thing ever yeah. i was like i'm i'm like well you look like one of them now right yeah it's exactly. like there's, a, there's exactly. an identification with and i you couldn't and wait to put on my toast. hood in the chapel the first time totally you know and so um I was I was very excited about it. That's when you re- receive your new name as well, yeah. and all your brothers do. Um, Why did you choose Mark Mary? So so my full religious name is Mark Mary Maximilian, mm-hmm. uh, Mark hyphen Mary Maximilian. You had to choose three. That seems a bit greedy. Well, you you got to respect the hyphen. You got to respect the hyphen. The hyphen <laughs> Mark Mary's one. Word. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, not my first time I've been called out on that. Uh, <laughs> I'm ready, so there's a I'm ready to fight. There. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. <laughs> um, so I'm baptized Mark. Mark Daniel's my baptismal name. Um, when I entered, I definitely, so I entered July or excuse me, September 8th, Holy name of Mary. Mm-hmm. No, excuse me. Uh, nativity of Mary. Um, and I wanted like a, a wild name. I was looking for something kind of crazy that nobody could pronounce that I'd regret from the rest of my life. Um, what were some candidates like Agathangelis or something like that? You know, like, and f- we have, we have one, one brother. He's going to be ordained a priest, uh, this month, Frontishek 
which is check for Francis. Okay. And he just has the, the difficulty of no one ever knows it's what like, his yeah, name it's is like, when that's he says okay. it. You can choose that. Yeah. <laughs> but just understand. No that one I'm going to be ever, calling yeah. you Pontiac. Yeah, or... exactly. So people can call you like, yeah, Frankenstein. I think he went by Frank for a little bit in uh, in Ireland. Um, so just there's consequences. Yeah. There's consequences. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm baptized. I'm baptized Mark the Evangelist, and it was on the holy name of Mary, which is only like four days after I was invested. I heard of this blessed, blessed Mark of Aviano, who was like, whatever, who was like leading troops in battle in like the Crusades, you know, calling out the names of Jesus and Mary. And I just heard that, and I was like, dang it. That's what it, that's what that's it's going to be, gonna be, you know? And so that was, and that was kind of confirmed through a couple of different people who were like, hey, you should check out Mark of Aviano. Um, but but when I was it was actually at Francis, Franciscan University where I was thinking about like what I would want as a like a patron for my name and it's like I wanted somebody who was a Franciscan who was a priest who was a martyr who had a love of Our Lady who was like a victim soul who did it all and that's Saint Maximilian Kolbe. Mm. Why didn't you choose that, Father Maximilian? Well, and that's part of the I think I think that's part of the discernment is um is I think what the Lord was telling me is like uh it's it's almost like. The, the proper order of the relationship between identity and mission. Like you, this is who you are. You like you. And, and Mary was the, the chosen Mary was very influential in my own location. It's like you're, you're, you're Mary's Mark. Like this is you mm-hmm. and this is, but, and like this, the maximum, like what you'll do is going to be, it's going to flow from that as secondary. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know? And, and I think um, the Lord spoke that into my life and the confirmation of it, which was, was interesting is uh, you enter Pasha C in September, you go home, about around Christmas time. And that's the last time you visit home for about a, a little bit over a year. And when I was home, I did like a little Google search of like, of Mark and uh, Mark of Aviano and Maximilian for their feast days. And so Mark of Aviano's feast day is August 13th. Maximilian is August 14th. And the assumption, like Mary is August 15th. And so when I saw they're like all lined up, I kind wow. of, that was kind of like the confirmation that this is what God Do wants. Do you have to get permission? For your name? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What? What? Had, do you know of somebody who has tried to choose a name and they were like, "Get out of here! Get out of here with that!" Oh name. yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. One, I, one of the the options for me was uh, was Maximus and not Maximilian. Yeah, but it was kind of like Maximilian, but it was kind of really like Gladiator. You, you, that, you know what I mean? I was kind of yeah. like, I kind of want like, uh, Maximus the Confessor yeah, yeah. is a popular saint yeah. in the East. Yeah, but but for me, it was just, that was it wasn't a whole. It really ah, was like yeah, yeah. it was like Gladiator Maximus, stuff. Yeah. yeah, but it was like no, because it's like the maximum of mary and mark and they're like no nah, nah, you nah, can get out of here yeah maximilian will be fine <laughs> um i'm trying to, a, a big one would be uh like a repeat we try to limit a that what? like so if oh. somebody already has the name oh i see yeah because you're taking on a new identity yeah. in a sense yeah or if like because they're they're in the process right now our, our uh, postulants are like discerning it right now like if everybody wanted the same name like there's going to be some like now, a, I could see there being uh, a danger in in getting the habit in ten months, because I could imagine people come in, they think you guys look cool, they want to look cool too, they just want to play the part. You're only giving them ten months. They're, they're thinking about their cool yeah. name. Does it does it feel like maybe you guys should be like you know five years wear the dorky shirt and the bad cross, yeah. not bad cross, but the dorky looking cross. Once you've earned your stripes, yeah. five years in, that's when you'll do it. Yeah. Why, why not something like that? Why only 10 well, months? Well, first of all, to put it in the context, a lot of orders, it's like after like three weeks or six days oh, or something okay. like that. So our, our 10 months. I didn't realize that. 10 months. Crikey. 10 months is long. Yeah. Like I know somebody who's, I think he became a Dominican over in Ireland. Okay. And it was like. Welcome. It was like, it was like a week. Yeah. <laughs> but um, because, but, but. um. And it's sim with sim with them as us. It's like when you're, you first receive the habit, you're not doing stuff very publicly. Like, yeah. so you're a novice and so you're not doing too much yeah. for about a year. You work with the neighbors, things like that. So the cause for the opportunity for scandal is somewhat limited. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know. It seems like 10 months. You can, you can do a lot. 10 months, isn't it? Especially, especially in formation where you have a strict regiment and yeah. schedule. Yeah. You probably get a yeah. sense of where a guy's yeah. at. What does your schedule look like? What's a typical day in the friary look Great. like? Um, I mean, I know you, it's probably very different because you all go on missions and stuff, but but it's not. And that there's there's wisdom to this as well. And I think it's something for everybody is um, not everything's on the table as far as being flexible. Like there is something that we're intentional about, and that sort of is the anchor and foundation of our life, which would be like our our, our rhythm of life. So so the prayer schedule, wherever you are, 
um, as far as like fryeries, it's going to be pretty standard and not open to adjustment, mm. you know? And so, so, in, and typically at 6 a.m. is going to be uh, office of readings, which is our first, first kind of obligatory prayer together. Um, in my house, I kind of have a bunch of like overachievers about, <laughs> about half of the house make an extra holy hour. They have a Eucharistic holy hour from 445 to 545 every morning. Awesome. Um, and they started that. They started it as an act of penance and doing sort of rep, like a reparation for the church, just a way to pray wow. for the church, to intercede for the church. Um, and uh, so, so those, so that's kind of like an optional thing. But then six o'clock, office of readings, seventh, and then personal meditation, typically like Lexio Divina for the next hour, seven thirty morning prayer followed by mass. And so, normative about the first two and a half hours of the day are going to be prayer. Mm. And then you go about your work, and that's going to look different based off of where you live. Midday prayer, lunch, um, and then we get back together for you, a, a common evening prayer, Eucharistic Holy Hour from five to six, six, six to seven dinner, do dishes together, and then depending on who you are, what you're doing, um, evenings would typically be a time for like pastoral counseling for me. That would be the time I talk to people, um, and that's and then Friday, that's our normal schedule. Friday is what we call prayer day, which is. Um, a little bit less in the apostolate. Is that right? And that's common among all friars, is it? Yeah, yeah. In wherever they are. Exactly. That's nice. What is that? So, so the idea is a day that's a little. It's almost like a, like a little retreat day, and um, a day to sort of prioritize prayer and contemplation above the apostolate, um, or just kind of take a step back. Um, and so, like, what for like most people, like what Saturday is kind of like the chill, kind of like catch up day, do yeah. laundry, whatever. That's your. That's ours, but it's kind of. It's not again, but it's like okay, it's a day to like lean in to the prayer and to the quiet, and so it's usually quiet in a friary. There's no talking except uh, until dinner usually, um, but that that would be something like that would be one of those places of struggle because the older you get, the more responsibility you have, the mm. harder it is to really protect. We talk about like protecting your prayer day, mm. and pretty much everybody in final vows is trying to get better at protecting their their prayer day. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, Saturday is kind of a normal work day for us. A lot of it, typically, it would be a day we go and pray outside of abortion clinic that morning. Um, and then Sunday, if you're, Sunday we'll have mass together, brunch together. If you're a priest, usually there's priestly things to do. Otherwise, it's a day to, like, hang out and take a nap. Do some guys find it difficult waking up so early when they first I arrive? Did. You did? That, I 100%. That was I hard. was pursuing being a friar for, like, four or five years. Changed my major, changed the total trajectory of my, of my life. The first time I made a come, like I, I visited the friars, and I it was six o'clock office of readings, and I was in the back of the chapel, and I thought I can't do this, hmm. and like I was like totally I can't do this. There's no way. Um, so for for me, from the very big, uh, early mornings and cold weather are always hard for me. That's why I never surfed. I'm a Southern California kid, but I never surfed because early mornings cold and the cold hmm. are not good for me. And there's still you you do grow into it. But you know, it is. It is. I think we're tempted to think if you're not getting up early in the morning, you're just lazy. But there is some other things. Like my wife has never been a morning person. Yeah. Um, I I'm very much a morning person. I mean, I, I I joke that I can kind of complete from like six a.m. to ten a.m. more work than people could in for for a work day. Yeah. I'm just like buzzing. But for me, around one o'clock, I start to oh, yeah, kind of, and it just it gets worse from there. Mm-hmm. And I, th- you know, I think some of us are just wired that way, and it's really difficult to yeah. reverse that. I think my my wife might have dips in blood pressure that's led to that while she sleeps. I think also some people have sleep apnea they don't know about, yeah. and so sometimes it's not a matter of like we'll just suck it up. And- yeah, yeah, and it's something I'm I'm kind of I don't have a final judgment on at this point. Okay. Um, but what what's interesting is I, and this is part of like what happened with this whole book. Excuse me. Is um, is if you pay attention to like religious orders like monks, cloistered nuns, religious orders throughout the centuries in the different cultures and times and all that. Like, I just think like if there's anything that they all have in common, you should like pay attention to it because like they're, they're just masters in spirituality and humanity. And one thing that they all will have is they all have like, they all pray in the morning. They all have like a pretty strict wake up time. And I realize it's not, everyone's going to be as easy. It's not going to be as easy for everybody. But I do think, and it doesn't have to be like super, it doesn't have to be four in the morning or six in the morning, but I do think some sort of intentional like yeah. intentional time that you wake up in the morning and, and ideally you try and get some prayer in. 
it seems to be it seems to be a, a wise absolutely yeah um but understanding that not everyone has sort of the you just don't you want to have leave some space in it for particularity and uniqueness but i do think i mean i'm not i'm not saying that because people are different in the mornings therefore some should be able to sleep then i think everyone should be bloody getting up i just think uh, like i actually had a friend who joined the companions of the cross up in canada for a while and um yeah he was kind of his whatever superior got him got on him for being a little lazy i don't know how he phrased it but it turned out he had really bad sleep apnea yeah. and so wasn't sleeping yeah. half the night and not knowing yeah. it you know yeah but yeah no i agree like getting up first thing of the day praising the lord and that's one of the things it's like with college students you like you're not even if okay you're a college student cool but you're still made to wake up at a like it can be nine yeah. o'clock you got to have it. But you have there you shouldn't you can't just be staying up till 4 in the morning and then sleeping in until nah. 12. Like that's just not that, that that's what being a 16 year old is for. No, I'm just joking. Yeah, but, but but yeah, it's just like I just stop being uh, a kid. Yeah, I just I don't think that's nah. going to serve you in the long run. Yeah. All right, here's what we're going to do. Okay. We are going to take a 3 minute intermission. Great. When we come back, I want to ask you about being a um secular franciscan what that might look like and then we're going to take some questions here on youtube and from patreon perfect all right all right do it video yeah there you go all right guys uh thanks for being back here chatting today with father mark mary from the friars of the renewal um we're going to take some questions now from the youtube chat uh and from patreon big thanks if you're a patron 
Um, before we do that, though, I want to say thank you to Catholic Chemistry. Maybe just change the camera angle there to my gorgeous face. You're welcome. Um, speak <laughs> Catholic Chemistry, yeah, good. Catholic Chemistry is a awesome online dating service that was started by my friend Chuck Gallucci. The two of us used to work together at Catholic Answers, and he had this dream to create the best kind of Catholic dating site, one that would you know, be filled with people who really took their Catholicism seriously. So maybe you're listening to us today and you're like, man, I want to be a friar of the Newell. I want to be a priest. I want to be a brother. But maybe you do feel called to marriage. And maybe in this COVID season, it's been difficult to meet people. And you're really serious about your faith. And you really want a husband or a wife one day who treats, honestly, Jesus more seriously than he treats you. Because to the degree in which he treats Jesus seriously, he's going to be treating you seriously. So go check out catholicchemistry.com. There's a link in the description below. And uh, click that. They'll know that we sent you. That'll help us out as well. You can do video chat on there so you don't have to give people your number or anything like that. You don't have to swap Skype accounts. You can actually chat with people in video chat from the website. And it's really excellent. So I would really recommend that. Um, yeah, catholicchemistry.com. Go, go check it out. All right. How are you doing? I'm doing well. That was a good look. That was a good. I, You're I, a pro. I, I joked about this last time. Yeah. I do not have the bladder of a Joe Rogan. I cannot uh-huh. do these like five hours. Do they not get up and go to the bathroom? I don't I've think so. No, because they're live streams. And yeah. It's pretty impressive. But, you know, it was funny. I just told you. I just got a text from my wife. She just said, uh, looking good. She's watching us. Looking good. Listening as I pay your bills. <laughs> it was so funny. Hey, Cameron. Hey, Cameron. We'll have lunch after. All right, man, this is pumped. This is good. Thank you for being here. This yeah, is, of course. You're giving a talk tonight, Franciscan. So I'm giving uh, I'm giving a talk to a household this evening and okay. then to the campus tomorrow. Nice to those who come. Yeah. All right, let's see here. Patron Philip Smith. And by the way, I mean we've been chatting for two hours. Yeah. You may have answered these. Feel free to take another kick at them. Sweet. This is more lightning round sort of thing. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Philip Smith says, Father Mark Mary, I love your videos on Ascension Presents. What advice do you have for Catholics looking to enhance their mental prayer? Any techniques or books you recommend? Um, I think the first thing I do recommend is, I mean, this we can, to, to pick up where we just left off, I really value quiet prayer time in the morning. I think like the, if you want, because right, if you want to pray well and to kind of have an ideal sort of uh, atmosphere for it, environment for it. I really think like it's, you know, like seek first the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. I really think putting that to practice and trying my, my like baseline recommendation is like, can we try and get like 10 minutes in the morning before you kind of turn on anything or start getting to work or whatever it is. Um, it's just an ideal time. You haven't sort of picked up some of the busyness of the day, some of the yeah. distractions of the day. And so I do really think that one of the first, uh, battles for prayer is, is praying in the right time and praying in the morning. And and then, you know, so that, that'll that be a good space to cultivate the habit. And then um, a second one, I'm, I'm, I think, I think is just intentionality and practice. So schedule a time and do it. And, and, um, and I think as you do it, like what's best for you. And what, there's, what does he mean by mental prayer for those who aren't aware of that? Oh, so, so mental prayer, what I'm, I, I'm assuming he's thinking of is basically it's like, it's you're, you're kind of sitting you're sitting and it might be meditation or contemplation would be kind of words that we'd kind of put as as mental prayer. Um, The rosary certainly ought to have a component of it, which is mental prayer, but it'd be kind of in juxtaposition, which what maybe we would typically call like vocal prayer. So maybe like reading the liturgy of the hours or saying a novena or something like that. It'd be probably a time for like Lexio Divina for quiet. And for just uh, ideally it's a time for us to speak to the Lord heart to heart. Yeah, that's beautiful. I'd recommend not picking up your phone until you've done it, you know, because it is such a temptation. You wake up, don't get yeah. any text messages, and then you're off and yeah. racing, your head yeah. spinning. But I mean, today I just kind of stumbled downstairs, turned the stove top on real low for my like Italian <laughs> espresso yeah. thing. It takes like 10 minutes to get. Yeah. And I just go sit and just, yeah. Just I just, I, I just, I, I, my like thing right now, one of my things right now is just, I, we just got to be praying in the morning. Got it. You, you, I love it. You got it. We got to be making that intentional mm sacrifice and we just got to be doing that you know one book i would recommend on mental prayer that i found really helpful was Teresa of avila's um what's it called mansion what's it called uh interior castle, interior castle. <laughs> i'm thinking of seven story mansion yeah yeah, yeah. yeah interior castle she has a lot to say on mental prayer yeah that's Shh. good this i think this book here personal prayer what is it it's by uh um, grab, it. grab it yeah because I, I some of this is just for show i didn't read that book so this <laughs> I, I believe this is the book yeah uh, i have a friend Who of mine it? It's two um, Benedictines. Oh, nice. Do you know? Do you know? The, oh, you Boniface, that's hilarious. I've got Father Boniface is coming on the show in a couple of weeks. I've heard. And he's got a book in my studio and I'd never read it. 
So do you know, you know, I blessed is she? Book? Do you yeah, know that, yeah. that ministry? Yeah, good things. Uh, yeah, a great friend of mine over there, is, her name is Beth Davis, and she's a woman of deep prayer. Hmm. And she has been reading this book and just can't stop talking about it. Really? It's a personal prayer. Give me that book. I've heard I'm going to take this with me on my about. retreat, maybe. That might, I've heard, I'm like 99% sure this is the book. Um, but this, this, I've heard incredible things about this. And Father Monovis is great. I haven't met him, but I've heard great things yeah, about him. yeah. Yeah, well, that's cool. Well, he's coming on the show soon, so I should probably read this so I know something about him. Cool. I'm taking that with me on my perfect, retreat. Perfect. I don't think you'll be disappointed. That and Father Elijah. Those are my books. Father Elijah? Michael O'Brien? Yeah. You I'll know, my son's a priest. What? Michael O'Brien's son is a Jesuit priest. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's awesome. He recently gives... He's um, He gives a talk on technology recently. He's, and it was he's he's really a that's fantastic. bright guy. Yeah. I'd love to have Michael O'Brien on the show. He he'd be great. Yeah, I I read the book before. I I made my son read it recently. And <laughs> have you read <laughs> Island read of the World? People keep saying I got to read that book. I think I read a bit of it. Is that where a son and a father wake up and they go on this journey? That's I, the beginning of it. I don't. That might be a father's tale. Yeah, Is maybe, that possible? Yeah, you're probably right. But Island of the World, uh, when I read it, was like my favorite book ever. For a lot of our guys, it is. Man, it's such a contempl. He's such a. Uh, he's actually he's excellent. Yeah, Father Elijah or Michael O'Brien. Everybody should go look him up and buy a, buy a novel today. Support Catholic authors. Buy it from Ignatius Press too instead of Amazon if you can. Uh, all right, uh, Jacob Murphy says, "What would Father? Thanks for being a patron, by the way, Jacob. What would Father Mark Mary recommend to an extroverted book lover and convert who plans to discern with the CFRs after RCIA, but also deeply admires the Cistercian contemplative practice?" Both are in my area, and I know I feel a call to religious life, but I'm unsure which order to pursue. Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. It's and an extroverted book lover. I like it. Extroverted book lover. That's a great combination. Yeah. It, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Would you, you would not I'm, consider I'm, yourself extroverted, no, or would I mean, you? I, I would consider myself introverted. If by introverted, we mean where I get my energy. Yeah. yeah. I, I read something that said my love language is to be left alone in, in a quiet <laughs> yeah. room. That's yeah. me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> and I'm too far down, right? I'm 38. I, there's no chance of reversing this or altering. This is. There's a few other my wife obstacles. Just has to there's work a few with other this. obstacles. Yeah. 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 Um, so, what, what I would say is first of all, just keep falling in love with Jesus, keep praying, keep growing in discipleship. Like, that is primary. And whatever your vocation is, is going to be the fruit of that relationship. So, just keep going there. The next step would probably be um, if there's an order, two or three who are kind of at the top of your list, is to give, give them a call. I mean, because that's like, that's. That's, that's that just makes sense like give them a call share a little bit of who you are what you're about and um and that's and then they can help kind of you navigate what might be the next best step for you so just give us a call give the cistercians a call um yeah that'd be the number Edward Chandler, thanks for being a patron, says, I've recently learned about Ignatian retreats the multi-month kind and sell <laughs> and salivate at the idea of doing one Ah, that's weird, but cool. Uh, but I'm about to get married, so that ain't going to work. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I like, like my patrons. I was going to say, you have good, good Oh, my gosh, they're guys. amazing. Any suggestions for bringing a strong prayer life into a marriage for someone who would totally become a Dominican if he hadn't discerned marriage? What was the first thing? So it's like a, a month. I've of... recently learned about Ignatian retreats, the multi-month kind. Are the people really go on multi-month silent Ignatian retreats? I haven't heard of this. I've heard of month-long Ignatian uh, retreats. Yeah, I've heard like 30 days. Um, I mean, I've never done that before. Uh, that is a lot. You know but I, mean? I love it, but I, I salivate over the idea, but I'm about to get married. Yeah. That ain't going to work. Yeah. Join the club. Um, <laughs> so probably... So, yeah, suggestions are bringing strong pre-life into marriage. Uh, game plan. I, j I do, like... Um, yeah, I'm all about that, and I, th I think I think intentionality is is my kind of buzzword at the at the moment. Is um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of, of basically... You can like so in our life, our life we have a prayer schedule for the day. We have a special extra prayer once, once in the week that the Friday. We have a little bit of extra retreat once a month, the Hermitage. Mm -hmm. We take a, a year long retreat, like it's five days. That kind of a, a way of like sanctifying the day, the week, the month, the year. So I, I would encourage like looking at something like that for your marriage, where okay, you want to have a certain amount of prayer each day, and then can you have. And so that might be 20 minutes or that might be, you know, I don't know where people are at. You want it to be at least 10 minutes. Um, and then if it can be more great and then something like, okay, once, once a month or once a week, excuse me, can you do something like a holy hour? Right. And so schedule it in, plan it, protect it. 
and and like okay every whatever it is every saturday morning from this time to this time i'm gonna make a holy hour so i and then maybe something a little bit extra maybe like one saturday afternoon like okay i'm gonna have a little extra time of prayer so i do think just having intentionality a rhythm but also some sort of like um progression of of quiet and of space throughout your your year like so your your excuse me your day your week your month your year um i think just some sort of rhythm like that could 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 work yeah awesome. that, did that make some sense that yeah. was a little bit all okay no it does yeah i uh, think my problem when i got married was i i tend to be very idealistic mm-hmm. um melancholically yeah inclined so for me i think i had an unrealistic expectation of what family prayer and married married prayer ought to look like yeah you know, either either my wife and I are praying yeah. over each other, weeping, or our children and I and my wife are kneeling on broken shards of glass yeah. while yeah. praying the rosary, um, and that really didn't help. That kind of got in the way. And I think our Lord would have been much more pleased if He had said, "Be patient with your wife yeah. and your son. You yeah. sit in it and yeah. be more creative in how you pray." Uh, one of the things my wife loves to say to women who are like, "I used to pray, you know, holy hours. Now I can't. I got a baby. Yeah. I'm breastfeeding." She's mm-hmm. like, "That's your holy hour." Yeah. Three in the morning on your chair, yeah. like that's your holy yeah. hour. Like yeah. turn your chair towards the direction of the church or something. Yeah. And I just, she's she's way more mature than me yeah. in that respect. I think yeah. that's right. I obviously haven't had the experience of praying as a mom, but yeah. I've heard that's a that's a development. That's a maturation. It just yeah. looks different. Yeah. Once you're in the book. But I, I think like consistency over like grand plans on yeah. being a prayer ninja. Yeah. yeah. Like every morning I'm going to pray whatever. That, if you're consistent, better that than like flash in the pans. Like 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, Christopher Belcher says, we have such extremes on both sides in the church and it feels like they are pulling it apart at the seams. How do we pull them back, especially on things that aren't required and there is a spectrum of beliefs that are allowed? It's a good question. Yeah, it's a great question. So, yeah, I think as, as he mentioned, like... Um, and I'll kind of speak somewhat personally as far as like uh, as a part of the Franciscan Franciscans. One of the, my great joys of the Franciscans is that we're sons of the church. And it's basically, it's like, we do have some things which are normative for us, but if the church is cool with it, like yeah. we're cool with it, right? Yeah. And so we have we have brothers who are, who are charismatic and want to go do a charismatic thing. We have brothers who celebrate the traditional Latin mass. And and so as, in, in my mind, it's like, we just want to be faithful sons, mm. sons and daughters of the church, right? Um, and so, and so I think like, yeah, I know that's hard for some people, but just to, if the church is cool with it, like we're cool that's, with it. That's been the kind of my guiding light as I try to run points with yeah. Aquinas is the idea that a faithful Catholic should not only submit to what the church teaches authoritatively, but should also not demand uniformity where the church allows diversity of opinion or custom. Mm-hmm. And that's a difficult thing to do, especially in a chaotic world where you're desperate for security. Right. And people tend to find these yeah. in certain devotions yeah. or something yeah. which they can then absolutize right. and yeah. feel the need to press on other people. Yeah. And so I think, I think um, just like you only have, you don't have that much control over all, most things. Right. You know what I mean? And so That's you're right. going to, yeah, like, so like for, for most of us as individuals, like our, what we should be, be paying attention to and spending our effort in is just our own discipleship, our own prayer life our That's own right. sort of uh, loving our, our families and I think um, and and having some some heart for some eye open to evangelization to working with the poor like just li- just follow Jesus and live disciple radically well that is I think um I think that's I think that's the starting point for most it, of it's us. It's funny because I think for most people they were like no 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 like I, I need to affect change right yeah. I need that's not radical enough but actually what you just said is the most radical thing a person can actually do if they want to affect change in any sense they yeah. have to first yeah. i have to first receive our lord's yeah. grace and flee from sin as from a snake uh, you know there's yeah. this i think i'm stealing this from from a priest um what's his name father boniface hicks no no not father boniface <laughs> i would probably like to steal many things from father boniface. Um, <laughs> including his beard am i right he's got a very strong Godly. beard he looks he would he he would look good in a fo- coffee table book you know he's got the, he's got the look um Father Parks, Father Parks, who's a he's oh, a priest. Oh, I he's, love Father he, Parks from um, Arizona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, love him. Don't tell him I said that. If he asks, I don't <laughs> oh, think highly oh, of him. Right. But between you and me, he's one of my favorite people. He's great. Where do you know him from? Speaking in universities okay. together. Yeah, in student yeah, he's great. Um, he 
gave a little talk about like the circle of influence versus the circle of concern and that our circle of influence is much smaller than our circle of concern. So it's like what yeah. you, what you're paying oh, attention to, what oh. bothers you, but what you can actually affect is, is somewhat small. And I think, I think there's, there's a little nuance to it, but at some point accepting that reality is going to be a source of a lot of peace, hey, man, you bro. know? Um, but also, so, um, Pope John Paul II says that the greatest force in human history is prayer united with sacrifice. And so if you do f- like live out your identity as a member of the priesthood of the baptized and you pray and you do penance and you sacrifice and you want to discern that and not make it a huge thing. And one like that, that it, that does something. And so if you pray and you do a little bit of like make a little sacrifice for the church, um, you can have confidence that that is doing something and that is actually influencing what you can't maybe influence in your day-to-day life. Hmm. Um, so don't like, I like don't, that about the two circles. Say yeah. That again. So the, the circle, um, the circle of, it's the, the concepts are the circle of influence and the circle of concern and the circle of concern. It's much bigger than oh. the circle of influence. Right. And so, I mean, that, and that's not just true in the wider culture. That's true in your house. Yeah, absolutely. In with, and as a parent, like with your children, like you have these concerns, like how they're eating or right. why they left their shoes there yeah. or why they're being too loud and uh yeah and so a um when we just on just the natural level can accept that there's gonna be a huge amount of peace um and it's not new it's like serenity prayer grant me the serenity accept the things i cannot change the courage to change the things i can the wisdom and no difference like grant me the grace to realize what is my circle of influence and what's not um but also not to underestimate and i think we do that not to underestimate the power and the grace of prayer united with sacrifice and just fidelity and discipleship. Um, St. Francis, right? He, he had an influence on the, on the church for whatever, like the last 800 years. And he wasn't, he was just following Jesus. He didn't even have a YouTube channel. He did not. I mean, he did not even have a YouTube channel. Can you believe it? Um, (laughs) But he just followed, he followed Jesus and the fruitfulness was there. So like, don't underestimate that. Yeah. Can I ask you um, what it was like when you started doing videos for Ascension Presents? Because you probably went from, I don't know, like they have a big platform. Yeah. What was that like for you? Was that? Uh... It was awesome. And so far as, uh, can I give a slightly extended answer? You can do as li- absolutely much as you like. Because uh, everything I'm doing in the media it was by accident. So I reached out. I heard a couple homilies from friends, from friars, from priests, and it was to like five people. And I'm like, this is gold. We got to do something to grow this. And so I reached out. I didn't know what I was doing. I reached out to the like the Augustine Institute, to Word on Fire, and to Ascension. Like, hey, you want to do something? Anyway, Ascension got back to me after about a two, like year and a half of conversation. I was trying to get other people to be doing it. It was like it basically just landed on me because you need somebody who's just going to be committed to it and follow through. Um, and so that was that's how I ended up doing it, and uh, something similar with the podcast. But um, Tell us your podcast. I don't think you've mentioned the name of that yet. So Poco Poco podcast, Poco, uh, little, Poco. Poco a Poco, little Poco by a Poco, okay. little little by little, and um, there's a whole that's a whole there's a whole thing behind that. But um, it's myself and and three of the brothers, Father Innocent, Father Angelus, Father Pierre Toussaint, Father PT, sit around a table and we kind of invite. We have a little conversation and and are just trying to help people make the next best step in their life. And that I was talking to three other brothers about doing a podcast. We're getting to the details had a benefactor call. Hey, do you need anything? We could use some stuff for a podcast. We got the podcast equipment. I went back to the guys I'm like, Hey, you guys ready to do this? And they're like, Oh, you're serious about that? No, we don't really want it. <laughs> and so I had like podcast equipment and I didn't oh, have any man. podcasters. So that's how I ended up ah. being that guy. Um, mostly it's, un- it's vulnerable and uncomfortable putting things out on the internet yeah. and like, uh, I mean, do you ever make the mistake of reading the YouTube comments? I, I do. I do it with some on Ascension. People are very kind generally because yeah. the stuff like you're an idiot or you're this or that like that doesn't really affect me um because we do get a lot of that you know yeah. um but but mostly it's just uncomfortable and a vulnerable thing but i'm grateful that it's been fruitful Good. and um it's i'm slowly i just i have a lot of peace in feeling chosen and called and um and so i have a lot of peace in that yeah. Do you ever accidentally compare yourself to Father Mike Schmitz and be like, ah, <laughs> "Why can't I be as good looking?" I, I mean, I, you are, but I mean, thank you, thank you. I, I do very distinctly know the very first video that did better than one of his in Didn't a you? given, in did a you given mark week that on the calendar. One hundred percent. Is that your honoring day from yeah. now on? <laughs> yeah, it only took a year and a half. <laughs> um, but I mean, he's just, 
and there's a whole thing there. He is a, he is a gifted he really man, is, and yeah. he is to to do a video every week for five, six, seven years, whatever it is. I tell you, man, that's yeah. no joke. Perseverance is yeah. a huge thing. Yeah. Commitment. Yeah. Yep. And so people, yeah. What's what makes him able to do what he does? People don't really have access to it, but there's a lot of sacrifice and discipline yeah. below. Well, you know, it's funny. I got a I got a I got a text message from my sister this morning. You'll like this. She's living in Australia, right? Mm -hmm. And she said, hey, you're interviewing Father Mark Mary tomorrow. Okay, so she sent it last night. Tom, that's our brother, loves him, often watches his videos. How cool. And then she said, I love when people evangelize our brother without my without my knowledge. Uh -huh. Beautiful. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, thank beautiful. you kindly for doing that. Beautiful. What a beautiful service. Beautiful. Uh <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I love getting called Father Mike Mary too. That happens a lot. Mike Mary. <laughs> Mike Mary. Or or like people like, Oh, you're on Ascension. Like, oh yeah, that's cool. Like I don't actually watch your videos, but I love Father Mike. It's like sweet. Uh, All right. Cool. Yeah. Oh, glory, man. Um, John, who is a super chatter, thanks, John, says, What was the biggest shock for Father Mark when he became a Fran Franciscan? Oh, What's I said Father Mike? What was the biggest shock for Father Mark? What's when, super chatter? Oh, that's somebody who sends money to so that their chat stands oh, out. Oh, nice one. And in fact, I mentioned earlier that my wife was doing bills. Yeah. And somebody sent a super chat, Samuel Varg. He says, here is a super chat so you can pay your own bills, I think, maybe. That was very nice of that Samuel. very kind. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, got but John wants to know what was the biggest shock about when you became a Franciscan. Um, I think... One of the things of living community life, which probably happens in parenthood as well, is you get very in touch with how not great you are. Yep. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because it is like you're I, I entered when I was 24. I was a missionary. I was this. I was that. I was like, you know, um, I was kind of like the pride of my youth ministry or whatever. And everyone thinks you're like a saint. And then you enter religious life and it's like, oh, I suck. Like, I'm like a jerk and I'm angry and I'm hard to live with. Mm -hmm. And so probably being awakened to my own that's a cool answer limitations it was the most i remember surprising. i mean it was such a youthful thing to think but when i served with net ministries of canada you're like okay i'm going to be with like 11 other people traveling the country yeah I, I remember someone said and you know it'll be difficult sometimes and i i actually didn't believe them at first i thought yeah. well, what could be wrong because i was a small country town i didn't know any other young yeah. catholics what would we have to disagree about and then the way the guy next to you is squeezing his toothpaste <laughs> makes you want to punch him. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and totally. I'm sure punch me too. Yeah. Yeah. Man alive. Okay. Um, Robert D. Bishop, thanks for being a patron, says, if you can summarize your experience in the CFRs in three words, what will they be? What would they be? Um, the real deal. Hey, that's really good. The real deal. Why? That's... I think it's, I mean, that's the the gift of the brothers. They're, they're just, they're authentic men of prayer, of discipleship, who love one another, who love the prayer, who love like the poor well. Like, and I just have insight into, to their authenticity and their realness that you can't, you don't put in a book, you don't put on mm. YouTube. It's just, um, the, the bros are the real deal. They really are. And, um, and that's like, what a gift that is to my own faith and my own discipleship. Like there's just, it's just, I live with really good men and, um, I love that. I wanted to ask you about the third order or the secular branch of the Franciscans. All right. I was, well, I'll say it because I don't think it was private. I was sitting around with Father Dominic Legg uh, at a Thomistic Institute conference. And I said, now, listen, people can become third order Dominicans or something. You know, I see these people have mm -hmm. OP after their name, flaunting it a little bit. That's fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's like, yeah, it's not a thing anymore. It used to be. It's not a thing now. I'm like, what about these people who hate? Like, that's cute. Like, he didn't say that. But like, yeah. the point was like, it's not really a thing we do anymore. It's, but. Well, do you know what he, like their particular Dominicans or the church? Or do you know what he was, what he was? He was referring to the third order Dominicans. Okay. That it's not actually a thing. I don't know if it's been disbanded or okay. if no one's really running it. It's not yeah. actually a. Yeah. Maybe I should let the man speak for himself. So I apologize if I misrepresented him, but that was the essential gist I yeah. took from it. Yeah. What is a third order or secular Franciscan? And is it a thing? Are there differences if the Capuchins or the TORs or whoever else is running it versus you guys? Do you yeah. have your own third order? Yeah. Um, I'm just starting to, excuse me, to wade in these waters and to learn a little bit about it. Um, we're not... We're, we're discerning and doing some steps to see what this could look like for us um, because we do we do feel like and it's 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 it, with our history of the Franciscans of the Dominicans to have these would be like lay members people who live in the world and are part of the lay state 
but who essentially are influenced and, and um, invited to share in a c- certain way in the charism of a religious order and some of the principles. And so they make commitments and they promises. Mm. It's still, and that's where I was like trying to, I was actually asking to see if like Father Dominic was shedding any light on it. There seems to be some change in what third orders are or the, they're like, they're standing over the last, I don't know how many years, um, probably in the last 50 years or hundred years as opposed to what it was 600 years ago. Um, but it's still a thing and still clearly there's, there's, uh, public associations of the faithful where, uh, the laity can be invited to share in a charism of a community and, 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 and the law says it can, it could be called a third order or okay. some other sort of name. So there, there is a thing we are discerning it and pursuing it. And, um, we're just not able to take, we're not able to sort of open the floodgates and say, everybody come on in at this point. But um, probably what it would look like for us and what it would look like, there are other Franciscan equivalents of it. And there's probably just be like, as there's a difference between different Franciscan orders, probably the different Franciscan third orders or equivalent would be slightly different as well. You know, I th- what I think would be really cool and something I floated with the idea of doing is creating a little prayer book that is essentially a rule of life, a prayer a prayer rule. Mm-hmm. Um, that, and, and you call it something, right? Like the, the brotherhood of the something. Yeah. Angelic doctor or yeah. whatever, yeah. Francis, you know? And uh, you, you may have one for women as well, but it's almost like a confraternity of men spread throughout the world who commit to doing this uh, what, prayer rule. Mm-hmm. And it's something simple maybe, where it's yeah. a morning prayer, holy rosary, whatever, evening yeah. prayer, something like that. Yeah. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah. Maybe there's like a particular medal that only they receive. Mm-hmm. And maybe they got to check in once a year to tell you that they're still part of this or else you nix them and they never yeah. get updates or something. So that it's a legitimate, com- almost like a commitment of people. And you're not just kind of getting numbers for the sake of it, but you're trying to be intentional about how many people are we, you know. Yeah. I think that'd be really neat. Does something like that exist? I don't think so. Okay. Not that I know of. Yeah. Imagine that. You guys do it like a, like a, like a bi-monthly Zoom meeting for people. Yeah. yeah. But again, they don't show up. They go. They leave. You gotta, you gotta be committed to this kind of thing. I think people really want to take faith seriously. Yeah. I mean, we could also fall into the trap of, you know, being married men who want to live as monks and things like that. You don't want to yeah. fall into that. But yeah, and that's essentially the desire, kind of underpinning that. I think is what we're trying to respond to is people nice. do want more, and they but they want, and they want some accompaniment in it. Yeah. And so we are, we're trying to respond to that in a way which is consistent cool. with our care. When you say trying to respond with it, are you looking at? Uh, do you have any expectation as to when something might? Um, roll out or? I mean it's in we've been we've been walking with a select group of people cool. and trying it out and navigating it for about six months now it'll be a year long process but then like some of this does have canonical hmm. um, components to it and so hopefully hope I mean potentially in the fall we'll have something that we can start to open up and cool. invite people into but we're just pursuing it and I'm just kind of using this kind of like more sort of uh couched or language or whatever just because we can't receive people at this it's point not all up to you and anyway. so i'm, I'm right. not trying to Fair enough. receive emails at this point <laughs> please don't email <laughs> yeah. me uh jamie shaw thanks for the super chat says i really struggle with being disciplined in my prayer life and daily life in general any advice to break the cycle yes by jordan peterson's 12 rules for life you go <laughs> oh good <laughs> be a great beginning am i allowed to plug my book here of course you can because a lot of the qu- this a lot of the questions that are coming up including really? the prayer and including this question i try to respond to in this in a really practical way this yeah. is the whole point of what how do i follow jesus but so, just so everybody knows there is a link in the description at the very top the first link goes to father mark mary's new book so yeah tell, tell so, us. so so my my primary i'll share again my own story the reason why I chose religious life over Dawson and priesthood is I felt like Dawson and priesthood was a better fit for my gifts and, and religious life was a better sort of response to my gaps, essentially mm. my weakness. And that my gifts without, if, if my gifts weren't built on a foundation of discipleship, it eventually did lead to my ruin. And so I share that because I need the brothers to support me where I'm weak. And so I'm very convinced, right, that not, not every grace that we need, there is essential grace, which is given to us in the chapel and in prayer, but not every grace we need is going to be given to us the fullness of grace isn't received just in the chapel sometimes the lord wants to give us grace by us asking for help inviting other people to share in our journey and so for me the will just grows slowly and it, and and so i think a, a primary way to respond to that and to help us to be faithful to our commitments is by inviting somebody else in some way to share in the journey and so i've heard of things like guys doing 
um, men or women like doing like a 30 for 30 with friends where it's like, okay, um, for 30 days, we're going to commit to having 30 minutes of prayer a day. And each day when we did it, we like check in together. And so then like somebody else is in it. If you're, if you're kind of slacking, they can help kind of encourage you. So I do think certainly discipleship, certainly some, some degree of, of, of discipline exercise is a great way to strengthen the will, but, but probably the quickest response is by trying prayerfully inviting somebody else to walk with you. Mm. Yeah. I think we seem to find it difficult to be consistent in small things. 100%. We all, I think we all kind of intuit that that's the right advice. You know, like you might want to get fit one day and so yeah. you might want to do something very heroic. And it's like, all right, how about you just run one mile every day for two weeks or something like that? Just kind of gradually. It's like, you know, I don't want to do that though. Like I want right. to, it's, we're very impatient. I am very yeah. impatient. 100%, which is why we struggle, mm. you know, because it is true. I think on natural things as well. Like I had a friend, I guess, who, um, a friend of a friend who was like the cook for some professional athlete. And they quit because it was so boring because they, they like ate the same thing every day. But there is something about consistency yeah. of prayer, consistency of, of life, which is really healthy. And it's, yeah. But that's, it's hard, though. I mean, two of the things Jordan Peterson says, which is why I mentioned his book, uh, I think are very, very wise. Get up at the same time. Eat regular meals. You know, So you might say, I'm going to get up at 7 every morning. And one way to be sure that you do that is just to set an alarm clock and plug it in and don't, don't adjust it. I mean, it's easier said than done, but you also might have yeah. three meals a day and just start there. Uh, yeah. And again, this is this is what religious and monks and nuns have been yeah. doing for whatever it is, 1800 years. It's nothing new. It's just a rhythm of life, some consistency, hmm. including meal and prayer time. It, it's just... It, I mean, it's hard. Like, I, I, knowing the right thing to do doesn't mean that it's easy to do the right yeah. thing. But I do Ooh, think. But I do well. think it's a good place to begin. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Do you guys have movie nights? We. So we don't have. That's a good question. Typically, we don't have anything to watch a movie on. <laughs> um, so that would be like the thing. Do you guys do puppet shows for each other? We do puppet shows. Nice. We, there is. There is. <laughs> there is at some community events skit night, but. I live in a formation house and so we do have like a DVD player and a yeah. TV that the guys use for like Bible timeline and some like Dr. Street yeah, stuff. That's nice. But they started doing a movie night pre-COVID with our neighbors. Hmm. And so once a month they would invite the neighbors in and we'd like project up a movie nice. and like make popcorn. And so that's the closest thing we have to a movie night, but we haven't done that for a long time. Very good. All right. Well, look, man, this has been wonderful. I'm pumped for you and my wife and me to go get Absolutely. something to eat. Can I ask you a question before we go sure, off? Sure, of course. You had Father Angelus on here. Yep. It seemed like did some like did his talk speak to you? It seemed like and you like it seemed like there was something about or was it just getting in touch with Father Angelus again? Do you remember? And you gave him like a really encouraging word did at I? the end of the podcast. You don't remember? I don't. I was just like because I saw I was like, dang, it seems like. It's something like Father Angelus got mad or something like that. Because you heard his talk I'm sure on campus. Did. I mean, I, so I, I've been going through a rough time since I moved here. Just yeah. really rough. And uh, uh, glad I'm here. Deep peace about this is where the Lord wants me. Yeah. But it's been turbulent. Yeah. Hospital stays, families needing sur- members needing surgery. And not, you know, all that, not without mentioning moving yeah. houses and all yeah. that. Um, so I was not in a good, I haven't been in a great place, honestly, for the last... I've been doing much better thanks to the help of a good friend of mine, Father, well, not Father, but Bob Shoots. Yeah. Him and I meet weekly, praying together. Great. I'm so grateful to his friendship and yeah. he's such a kind guy. He he actually wrote to me a couple of weeks ago, just out of the blue, he wanted me to endorse his book, right? So I've been to one of his conferences, mm-hmm. but I don't know him. Yeah. But he's writing a book on sexual healing and intimacy. And yeah. he reached out to me, he wanted me to endorse his book and... I read it, but I was just—I was just not a good place. And, and so he's like, "How you doing?" And I'm like, "I want to smoke pot and listen to Radiohead." So not great. Mm-hmm. Like it was just like at yeah. my bottom. I, I didn't do those things, right? But I'm just like, I just want to escape. I'm doing yeah. terrible. And he—I just want to affirm him. He doesn't know me. He met me once, but he started meeting with me weekly, and we've been praying. Mm-hmm. And um, man. So yeah. gratefully, I even said to him, "Like, hey, I, I just want you to know, I'm so grateful. I know, I know you're a busy guy. I'd love to be able to maybe like." Pay you or your apostolate. I was trying to say it in the most yeah. 
a way that he would accept it. Yeah. He's like, no, I don't want you yeah. to give me any money. That's not yeah. what this is about. I want a journey yeah. with you. So, man, it's yeah. been beautiful. I, I met him like literally a week ago for the first time, but I've heard a lot about him. And I know like some of the, the people who know him and they they couldn't speak higher. Yeah. Like he's, he's the real deal. Yeah, he's beautiful. He's so beautiful. Yeah. I love him. Yeah. Um, but why did I bring him up? You asked, oh I, yeah, so my point was, so I saw that the Friars of the Renewal were given a talk on campus. Yeah. I'm like, I want to go to that. So I did. Yeah. And I thought his talk was fantastic. I love him. I, I loved him immediately. I, his joy, his humility, mm -hmm. his, I mean, you know him better than me, so maybe he's worse or better or both. But <laughs> yeah, um, he's good. He's good. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I didn't go there thinking I'd say, come on my show. It's yeah. just, we got to talking and he had heard of me. It always surprises me, you know, when people are like, oh my gosh. You know, that happened to you this morning, right? We went yeah. to that coffee shop yeah. and the barista yeah. was like, oh my gosh. And I'm yeah. like, why didn't you ever do that for me? <laughs> like, because you suck. Um, so he came on the show and I, honestly, I forget. I'm sure it was a blessing to me and the Lord's okay. used his words, yeah. but I don't remember specifically. Yeah. At the, at the very end, you just like really affirmed him and encouraged him. And that was good. That was good of me to do that. That was very good yeah, of you to do Holy that. It was the Holy Spirit, yeah. I'm sure. Please God. So, I mean, if you wanted to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like, no. Oh, man. I'm just putting... Well, hey, let me do it. Let me do it. Um, and and this, isn't, this isn't false. One of the things I'm trying, I'm realizing about myself is, well, let's see how to get back into this. I said to Bob the other day while we were praying, I said, you know, there's a part of me that hopes YouTube bans me because I'm, I'm, I just would like this to kind of end. There's a part mm -hmm. of me that wants this to end. Yeah. I just want to be with my family and I don't want to be this, hey there kind of thing. Right. And now if that happened, maybe I'd regret it and wish it would come back and fight for it or something. But I was talking to Bob about that and he's like, yeah, part of that is just this, maybe this desire not to have to, I forget how he put it, but like put on a show, pretend. And, and it just sort of exposed something in me in a loving way that, I do that. I, 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 hey, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm not just like, hey, me. Yeah. And I, and I suppose that is maybe comes from this place of like, I want you to like me. Like, mm -hmm. it's important to me that you think I'm someone special, that you think, that you say nice things about me to other people. And this just comes from this deep insecurity. So, one thing I appreciate about you is there seems to be an absence of that. Like, you seem very comfortable with yourself. There's not like a, you know, and I, I really, Actually, you, you, I really felt put at ease this morning when we met in the hotel lobby. Within five seconds, I'm like, yeah, here's a guy who doesn't seem like he's pretending. And that leads me to not want to pretend. Good. Is that good? That's great. All right. That's great. Tell us, <laughs> tell us where people can learn more about you. We've got the website, mm -hmm. friarsofthereneal.com. Uh, just franciscanfriars.com. Way cooler. It's amazing yeah. you snagged that yeah, one. Yeah, exactly. Franciscanfriars.com. Exactly. Uh, your excellent new book, which I don't know is excellent, but I assume it is because you seem to be. Habits for Holiness. There's a link in the top. People can go check that out. Your podcast? The Poco a Poco podcast. How do you spell a, that? So it's it's uh, Poco, P-O-C-O, -O, right. space, A, space, P-O-C-O, -O, Poco a Poco podcast. <laughs> okay. And it's uh, we're just added, we just added a video, so that's a new thing, but um, it's wherever podcasts are listened to. And that's honestly, I like that a lot. I think it's good. So if you want to kind of keep going in discipleship, check that out. Yeah. We, there's a lot of banter. Like, there's a little like, chit chat and that can be annoying to some people, but just for the first couple of minutes, we're young. And and you guys are going to be filming this stuff soon, right? It, yeah. So it's starting, it's starting to come out in film. So what I've found is this, because I also agree, like sometimes banter is annoying, especially yeah. when you, you're there for a topic. You're not yeah. there to hear you crap on about something. But I think people do like love you and love yeah. the banter because yeah. it's very real. Yeah. So what I do to get around that, and maybe you could do it too, is like, look, we've just been recording for two hours and 48 minutes. Yeah. But then what we do is we take smaller clips out. Yeah. And so people can consume it that way. And yeah. You could do something similar. Yeah, right? exactly. And so that's the hope. It's just, you know, that's time and resources. And cool. so we're just getting started. All right, man. That's it. You ready to click that final thing? We'll wrap up. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Uh, do us a favor if you want subscribe here's what i like about you subscribing all right shut up and look at me hey you not you that would have been terribly rude you uh if you subscribe and click that bell button you see to it that youtube will let, alert you whenever we put out a new video and since this is a christian channel you are essentially making youtube evangelize you why wouldn't you want to do it why wouldn't you want to do that so click that subscribe button click that bell button uh, this coming, th well, we've got a bunch on next week. Anyway, we've got a bunch coming on. So just sign up, subscribe. See you later. God bless. Thanks. Cool. Cool. That's